Before the dream, everything was normal. Saturday had arrived after a long, tiring week of work. I was an IT technician. It was the kind of job where we would assist customers varying from software issues to networking ones, and occasionally, the job would require us to meet them on their turf to provide on-site service. Fortunately for me, I wore multiple hats, which meant I had to tackle more on-site visits. Some would think of me as a versatile, irreplaceable employee, and you wouldn't be wrong. I, however, wouldn't look past the glaring fact that the company was just being too cheap to hire others, opting to milk every ounce they can get from us. They're understaffed employees. You see why I would spend most of my weekends only sleeping and watching television, basically anything that required the least amount of work or movement. Unfortunately, these tactics made them fly by faster than usual. There's nothing worse than expediting your rest days to your work ones. This weekend, I decided to mix it up a bit. Instead of my usual lazy days around my apartment, I decided to venture out and visit my parents. I hadn't been home in two days. I couldn't remember the last phone call I made to them, so I figured I was overdue for a visit. Home was around 50 miles away, but that didn't seem too bad compared to most people I knew. I had plenty of friends who were clear across the country from their folks, so I knew I had no room to complain. To be honest, I was looking forward to the drive. The ones in the morning were the best. Watching the sun gradually rise, feeling the cool breeze while coasting the near-empty streets. Absent a river of traffic. Is there a better time to travel? Couldn't wait to see my dad or my stepmom either. I could already picture the two of them ambushing me with hugs while releasing a barrage of questions about how everything was going in my life, and I hadn't even gotten to the best part. Home-cooked meals. Energized by those thoughts, I quickly packed up a few things, toothbrush, clothes for one night, towels, anything else I could thought I might need. For a second, I thought about giving them a quick heads-up call to let them know that I was coming. But I refrained, thinking it would be better if my visit was unannounced. After my car was loaded, I pulled out of my apartment area and began the drive. As expected, the sun had barely peaked beyond the horizon. The drive itself was smooth and fluent, with barely any other cars on the road. That's just the way I like it. As early as it might seem to some people, my parents were early birds. They got up at the crack of dawn to maximize their day, taking care of small things throughout it, cutting grass, morning runs, errands, etc. It didn't take long before I reached my old hometown. I was met with a familiar setting, rendering old memories. Almost at every angle, I could recall some event from my life while growing up. And it wasn't until I looked in the rear mirror that I noticed I had a smile pressed on my face. It's no hiding, I guess. I was happy to be home. Eventually, I reached my neighborhood, turning onto the street where my parents lived. From the distance, I could see their house at the far end on the right. I drove down the street, glancing left and right, attempting to see if old neighbors were still present in their homes. Just from a glance, I could recognize what houses had new people and which ones had familiar faces. Only a few were actually up and outside. One person in particular, Mr. Harris. He was infamous for always attending his yard. He was mainly seen cutting his grass and did so in a full jumpsuit, regardless of how hot or cold the weather shifted. It vaguely resembled the ones prisoners would wear, except it was navy blue instead of bright orange. I reached my parents' house and I parked next to the mailbox. The driveway had my dad's car in it. My stepmother's car was usually kept inside the garage since it was a newer vehicle. The house itself was fairly big. Two stories with all white siding that made up its exterior. It had burgundy shutters to accompany each window, a decent sized porch with a bench on it. After parking my car and walking up the door, I could already see the screen door closed to allow the cool air to run through. The aroma of bacon and eggs filtered outward, along with the sounds of talking and moving around. Despite still having a key to the place, I rang the doorbell, along with the sounds of talk. Intently, I heard my dad's voice, grumpily questioning out loud who would be visiting at this hour, and I could hear his footsteps, walking over until he emerged into the entrance hallway. I see his eyes widen. A smile grew on his face. He called out to my stepmom to come over to him, and when she did, I was met with a loud cry of joy as she raced over to the door, opening in it, and pulling me into a vice-like hug. After about a ten-minute moment of hugs and greetings, I was finally able to settle in brought all my stuff into my room, which was in the basement. The basement, of course, was finished. and had a big television in front of a couch, along with a washer-dryer down there. It was almost like a second living room. 
perfect for having guests over or even a tenant for renting. The day went by fairly quick. I spent most of it talking to them about my job, politics in the world, and other recent events. It wasn't until the evening arrived when my dad announced that in his spare time, he had managed to convert all the old home movie tapes into DVDs. <laughs> my dad was always the type to keep busy. He worked hard throughout the week and even on the weekends because he was unable to cope with the downtime. It was in these times that he would keep himself busy with small side projects. And these projects varied from big ones like installing new floorboards to small ones like planting fresh flowers outside. Apparently this time his project had been converting the old tapes before they became too bad to view. We decided to spend that evening watching the old movies to gawk and laugh at the old days in our lives. Popped in the first disc, left temporarily to use the bathroom. Video appeared to be during Christmas time. Footage was very grainy, producing a few white streaking lines across the screen. The timestamp in the corner read December 25th, 1991. In the video, we could see a big tree in the background, heavily decorated with tinsel and ornaments. Below it, a multitude of presents covered the floor, varying in size. Off to the side is my mother. My real mother. Very young in appearance. She must have been at least in her mid-twenties at the time. I didn't get a chance to know her. My father informed me that she had died when I was too young to remember, and I only, I only recognized her from photos that I had seen lying around. It wasn't until I was old enough that my father explained her death. Her death was in fact a murder. Some crazy loon had broken into their apartment and shot her. He didn't really like to speak about it. I didn't blame him because because of his feelings, I never pressed him for more about it. The camera in the movie sat fixated without shaking, giving the assumption that it was on a stand. Soon after my father appeared from behind the camera to join her on the ground, he too was young in appearance. It's strange to see them this way. I heard about a small amount of laughter from me. They both seemed to have their eyes fixated on something. It wasn't until my dad adjusted the camera I could see that something was me. <laughs> There I was, a younger version of myself checking the timestamp on the screen confirmed I was one year old. I watched in awe as my younger self hobbled around, curiously grabbing small things around the apartment. Occasionally, he would render a smile to my parents whenever they called out my name in a soft tone. The moment was nice until the screen went to complete static. The sound was a little distorted, but it was clear the video was not over. I could make out what sounded like a knock at the door from the audio, but I couldn't I wasn't sure entirely. My dad returned just as this happened and went over to the television cursing at it. He finally ejected the DVD and popped in a new one, informing us the rest of the tape must have been too bad before the full recording. And we didn't let that hinder the moment. We prepared ourselves as the next disc loaded up. After a long evening of laughing and admiring our younger images on the home movies, we decided to call it a night. We said our good nights, my stepmother promising to cook us a big breakfast tomorrow. Made my way downstairs and changed into my pajamas, eventually laying on my old bed. I lay there for a couple of minutes, smiling to myself, still thinking about the videos and other times I had while growing up. Without realizing it, I found myself asleep. Now this is when it all happened. This is when I had the dream. In this dream, I found myself back in that old apartment I had viewed with my parents earlier in the home movie. It was odd though. Unlike the angle the camera appeared in the video, I was standing offset of it. It was an angle that didn't appear in the video and yet somehow I could see more of the apartment with greater detail. From the kitchen in the back, its sink full of dishes to the picture hanging on the wall. I wasn't sure how this amount of detail was applied because clearly I was just a child at the time and remembering this would be impossible. There was a possibility that my brain was just filling the gaps of the apartment with places that I had seen and been to, but deep down, I thought otherwise. It felt like everything being presented was exactly how it was at the time. Around the apartment it was clearly Christmas time like in the video. 
I continued to look around, noticing my dad standing behind the camera exactly like in the video, and my mother sitting on the floor in the view of it. As if on cue, he walked from behind the camera, and he sat next to my mother. It was literally like being present in the footage, scene for scene. I attempted to grab my parents' attention. I tried calling out to them, waving and even touching them, but it was... It was like I didn't exist. They couldn't see or hear me, and my hands went through them, almost as if I was a ghost. My dad then shifted the camera to where I could see my younger self cooing and hobbling around to my side. I watched as the younger me began playing with books, curiously trying to figure out the object. And suddenly there came a loud banging at the door. The noise startled me, my parents included. I watched as my dad rose and went to check the door. The door itself had a small peak hole, and I recall that I remembered hearing what sounded like a knock from the distorted video. I heard my dad mumbling something in a confusing tone. It was something around the grounds of the peak hole, with either being covered or that someone was standing really close to it. At this moment, I, I got an uneasy sensation in my stomach. For whatever reason, I, I got the feeling that opening that door would be a mistake. However, before I could react, my dad unbolted the locks and he opened the door. He was immediately struck with the barrel of a gun. I watched in horror as he grabbed his now bleeding head in pain. The assailant kicked my father back, causing him to fall over next to my mother. My mother let out an ear-piercing scream in fear. The assailant came through the door, shutting it softly behind and locking the bolt across. Afterward, the assailant gave off a hissing shush about my parents. Hearing the voice confirm that it was a man, he stood silent, pointing the long-barreled gun at my frightened parents. I was too frozen in fear even knowing I couldn't be seen. The man wore a long black cloak over his body, with a hood draped over his head, a few chains looped from his waist, connecting his hip. When I looked closer, there were several faint gray inverted crosses on the side of his hood, on the back of his cloak. Was this man a part of some twisted religion? I carefully made my way around him. He remained in the same position, appearing to not show any indication of my presence, yet I still wasn't taking any chances, and when I finally reached a good angle to see his face, my heart dropped. He was wearing a pale white mask over his face. The mask was glossy. The eye holes were wide open along with the mouth, both completely veiled in black. I, it gave off an eerie chill. It was as if the mask itself was frozen in fear, emitting an ear-splitting scream for its life. We all just remained still with what felt like a... A long hour, and finally my dad managed to mutter a question to the man, asking him why he was doing this. The man, of course, remained silent, ignoring the question. My mother was still whimpering to herself, and my dad kept his head low, applying pressure to the wound on his head. He repeated his question with more anger in his tone. The man finally made a move. Taking out a second pistol from within his robes with his other hand, he raised and pointed it in my direction. My heart began rapidly pounding in my chest, more than it had before. Could this man finally see me? Was he always able to? And I raised my hand up in a surrender pose while backing up a little, and when I did, I realized the angle of the gun was slightly off. He was pointing it in my direction, but not at me exactly. And I turned my head to see what he was in fact pointing the gun at. The younger me. My mother let out a loud shriek, and the man had the gun in the direction of my one-year-old self. Of course, being one-year-old, I didn't seem bothered by the gun. In fact, I was still playing around with the book from earlier, oblivious to the whole situation. What was the man planning? Why did he break in to begin with? He clearly didn't want anything from my parents. They didn't, they didn't have anything expensive at the time. And more importantly, why was he pointing a gun at, at a one-year-old child? My heart dropped even further when I heard him cock the gun. What reason would he have for doing this? What, what would it accomplish? My mother attempted to move towards me, but the man refocused his gun on her, cocking that weapon as well. I looked back at my younger self, who in turn looked up at the man, giving a blank, innocent stare. The man appeared unfazed, solid in stance. I could see his fingers slowly squeezing back on the hammer, heart still racing. I quickly moved in the path of the gun, hoping to obscure his view. Realizing it wouldn't make a difference, I grabbed the gun, but my hand phased through it like before. I couldn't touch him. His fingers gradually continued to squeeze back on the trigger. It was like, it was like viewing the moment in slow motion, taking forever to occur. 
unexpectedly, I felt my mind being flooded with images. They were images of people. They looked to be, to be people I knew throughout my life, almost like a photo album. Endless images of moments and faces flashed by, and I saw my mother, my father, my friends that I had known, girlfriends I had relationships with, everyone. They continued appearing, one after another, and as they did, I felt a pulsing pain grow in my head. I couldn't take all the images at once, it was too much, and yet they persisted. I found myself on my knees as the images began appearing at a faster rate. I was now gripping my head, almost shaking uncontrollably until they ceased without warning. The air felt cold. The warm colors around transitioned literally to a grayscale-like color. I looked up slowly, and when I did, I saw the flash of the barrel go off. Followed by the sound of a loud BANG! I turned around to find the lifeless body of my younger self lying on his back, a pool of blood quickly forming around him. The air was silent. My parents were speechless. Frozen in grief, the man lowered his gun, eventually letting it drop to the ground. We all remained silent and completely still. He proceeded to lift his hand, removing his hood. Afterward, he slowly removed the mask from his face. My eyes... My eyes couldn't comprehend what they viewed. This... This man, this... Murdering, psychopathic, religious nutcase's face was was my face he had he had the same face as me the current age me tears formed in his eyes and slowly made their way down his face he turned to my parents a small smile formed across his face it wasn't a twisted evil smile or satisfied one no his smile and his eyes held a deep sense of sympathy with it he spoke quivering words I'm sorry. I, I had to. I, I did you a favor. Forgive me. Without warning, a blinding white light appeared out of nowhere, completely engulfing me, and I saw a face appearing amidst the white. Before I could make it out, I immediately jolted awake by the alarm on my cell phone. I sat up quickly. The dream was still burning in my mind with every excruciating detail. When I looked down at my hands, I found them trembling. I put them to my sweaty chest to feel my heart knocking around uncontrollably to no end. What the hell kind of dream was that? After the dream, I couldn't fall back asleep again, or actually, actually, I didn't want to. It was just so disturbing, and more importantly, too realistic. Lucky for me, it hadn't been too early in the morning. Soon my parents would wake up as well. That thought comforted me a little. I didn't want to be alone. As expected, I could soon hear my stepmother's adhering to her promise cooking that large breakfast upstairs. Before heading up, I made sure to compose myself in the best manner possible. I didn't want them questioning me about the ordeal. It was just a dream. I wanted to prevent any reason to call it, at least not at that moment. It was too soon. I ascended the stairs, made my way to the kitchen where I was greeted happily. I, of course, lied about how I slept, we ate breakfast silently for the most part. Luckily, they were deeply involved with the Sunday paper, or they were on their tablets. After eating, I thanked them for the meal. I promised I'd visit more often. I wanted to leave as quickly as possible, so I told them I had to leave early to prepare for work the next day. Packed up my things, said my goodbyes, before entering my car. Meditating on that incident really helped me wrap my mind around it. Helped me realize that it was just that. A dream. There's no deeper meaning to it other than my mind conjuring up a freakish set of images based off what I had seen prior to. As time went on, the images began acting more like a dream. I said I'd never forget it, and yet, like the typical ones, it slowly was slipping away from me. I was ready to head back. Before I could turn my car on, my phone went off. On the other end was my boss. He asked me how I was doing, if I was willing to do an extended on-site service for a client, possibly for a week or two, depending on the number of computers. 
The project involved establishing networks and accounts. Mentioned the client would provide room and meals. Seeing nothing wrong with getting out of the office for a while. I agreed. I asked who the client was. He told me it would be a service provided by an independent church. To be continued. I was particularly excited about this on-site job. Later on that evening, my boss called again and filled me on on more details about the request. He told me that traveling to the church would be quite a drive, and that its location was on the countryside, secluded from most towns. He gave me strict instructions to abide by their basic rules and to not offend them by any means. And apparently, they had they paid handsomely for the service, and he wanted to be sure our company kept every dime. He did note that I only had to respect their rules and not necessarily buy into any of their religious activities or anything. He told me to stop at the office in the morning for the necessary equipment. He promised that the company would reimburse me with the cost of travel and reminded me to call daily with any updates. So I wasn't a big fan of religion, but I wasn't going to complain if they were providing food and room for sleeping. Again, it was a chance to get out of the office for a couple of days, and that night I quickly packed up enough items for two weeks in this big suitcase. After preloading my car, I set my alarm early knowing that I would need to compensate for the drive. It was strange. My night was dreamless, and it was quick. I felt like I had closed my eyes for a second before I heard my alarm go off for the next day. What struck me even odder was the fact that I couldn't recall what had stirred me up the night before. I had a disturbing dream when visiting my parents, that much I knew, but of what specifically evaded my memory. I dismissed the thought, believing that it would just be for the best. Despite being tired from the early rise, I was up without a struggle and ready to embark. The outside air was cooler than I usually preferred. The sky was starless, almost like a dark veil was across it. I hopped in my car and I kept the window up this time, with the, the heat at full blast. There were a few times when my eyes rolled back from the tiredness, but the radio kept that temptation at bay. I made the quick stop by the office to gather up all the necessary equipment needed for the job. My boss already had it packed and ready to be loaded upon my arrival. He wasn't there himself, but with the help from the third shift crew, I was able to load everything into my trunk. Afterward, they provided me with a set of GPS directions provided by my boss. Once I thanked the crew for helping, I made my way on the road. The further I drove, the more scarce the streetlights and other cars became. Before long, the sun had fully emerged, giving sight to the endless oceans of green pastures and cornfields. Eventually, though, even the pastures came to an end, and soon I found myself swallowed by the dense patches of trees. My car barely managed to remain on the thin, rough path, below I could hear rocks and twigs crunching under the wheels. I held my breath a few times, slowing my vehicle down, hoping to not incur a flat tire, which was the last thing I needed. After what felt like ages, I finally came across a fairly large building ahead. The building itself was an old structure, standing tall and stretched far back into the wood. Its appearance was withered, made of old wood, pale and decayed. It swayed a few times at the course of the wind, letting off a more disturbing groan as if suffering, wishing to be put out of its misery. Truly, it was amazing that such a building hadn't already collapsed. Continuing to approach, I could make out more of its structure. The building appeared to be two stories. Its front was rather plain aside from the monotonous row of windows, a row of three that ran across the second floor. The windows themselves were elongated, running along the sides of the building as well. I was thrown off by the sight of the structure. I was sure my boss had informed me that this was to be a church. And I wasn't much of a churchgoer, but that building before me looked like an old warehouse or boarding home rather than a place of worship. The rugged path led up to its entrance. In the front of a set of double doors, I could see a lone figure standing, waiting for my approach. It was an elderly man in his mid-fifties, in a gray suit and black tie. He immediately made his way to me when I parked. His walk was hobbled, but elegant in poise. A little hesitant, I gradually let down my window, greeted by his big toothy smile. Afternoon, son, he said with a strong country accent. You're that technician we've been waiting for. 
I was taken back by his overpowering cologne. It smelled like a pork concoction of baby powder and sunflower seeds. He was balding towards the top of his head while his snowy white hair grew around the edges like a crescent. Deep wrinkles were pressed across his face and seemed to grow in number when he smiled. I slightly stuttered an answer. <laughs> yeah, 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 sir. Yes, sir. Pleased to meet you. There's no need to be shy, son. I'm Reverend Gary Gooding. You can call me Gary. Welcome to Peach Herb County. He said, extending out a hand. Nervously, I shook it. I'd like to personally thank you for coming all the way out here. I know it must have been something for you. I hope you didn't get too lost on your way over. For some reason, I couldn't find my voice. I only shook my head. That's good. Look here. Why don't you swing your car around aside? I'll go get my people to help you get your stuff settled in. You don't have to lift a finger, understand? He gestured to the right side of the building. I nodded, and I drove around as instructed and parked. Before I could even evacuate my vehicle, I jumped when I stared ahead. There was a man standing in front. I, I hadn't even seen him approach. I couldn't lie. He was much younger than the Reverend, but clearly older than me. He had slicked back hair combed over to the side and wore a dark vest resting over a white button top with gray dress pants. He gave a slight wave while approaching my car. I exited and was greeted with a firm handshake. Terrence, Crow, he said. His accent wasn't as strong as the Reverend's. Welcome to Peachurp. I could tell his smile was forced. Even his eyes looked annoyed, but I thanked him. You have any luggage on you? He asked. Yeah, I said. It's, it's in the back. I unlocked the door. Before I could turn around, the man quickly swooped over to the passenger door and opened it. He pulled out both suitcases. He began making his way towards the front, gesturing with his head. Y'all have to forgive my impatience. I was in the middle of something important before the Reverend had me pulled to assist you. Uh, that's all right, I assured him. I know the feeling. You'd be surprised how often my boss does that to me. I sometimes wonder if he actually wants me to get the job done. <laughs> he joked, hoping to lighten the mood. He didn't laugh. I could hear his grunts as he struggled to carry the weight of my suitcases, occasionally swaying to the side. I felt guilty for letting him do so, but didn't want to impede on their hospitality. He led me around the front and through the double doors. I half expected to find the Reverend waiting for us with his grin, but he was nowhere to be seen. Inside, we came into what looked like a lobby area. It was much nicer than I expected, completely different from the outside appearance. Inside, the air was cold, borderline comfortable. Perhaps it was the hint of honey and sunflowers in the midst that made it bearable. The lobby was a simple room. Everything around held a calm pearl white. It was filled with a few tables and chairs, up against the wall, a golden chandelier hung from the ceiling, giving the bland room a more elegant feel. A red carpet led from the entrance to a set of closed double doors ahead. Two other doors sat on the left and right walls, both closed. The man led me inside, setting down the suitcases. He took a handkerchief from his vest pocket to wipe away the sweat from his brow. <sighs> this here's the lobby, he finally said, tucking the handkerchief back in his pocket. I chuckled to myself as if that wasn't obvious. To the left, he continued, you'll find that hallway leading to the dining area. To the right is a staircase leading to the living quarters. You'll be staying in room six. If you give me a minute, I'll fetch your keys. And what about those? I asked, gesturing to the main double door area. Where do those lead to? He glanced towards the doors, as if realizing their presence. Ah, oh, those lead to the congregation room, where we conduct our services. You'll find we conduct those on a daily basis. Daily? Well, that's a bit much. I said jokingly, whatever happened once a week. Again, he didn't laugh. His face stern and solid. Mister? Pale. Marcus Pale. Sorry, I never uh, didn't introduce myself, I replied. Right, Mr. Pale. This is a church. I'm sure where y'all come from once a week will suffice, but here, it is our life. He paused, peering into my eyes. You do attend church, right? My eyes must have truly given it away. He smiled, shaking his head. You're not much of a religious man, now are you, Mr. Pale? The tone of his voice matched his face. I shrugged slightly, taking off beat to the question. No, I, I guess not, I answered. I see. Well, please forgive me when I say this then, but maybe you should keep your mind open when you're on the job. That is the reason why you're here. Understand? Yeah, sure, I replied dryly. Good. 
I'll be back with your keys. I just stood there. The nervous feeling I had earlier had subsided. Now what I felt was... awkwardness. What was this guy's problem? There's no need for his rudeness. The pity I felt for him earlier was no longer present. Yet I shook it off, remembering that my boss said not to offend these people by any means. Five minutes went by. Still found myself standing there. What was taking so long? He made it sound like the keys were right behind the door. My eyes began wandering, bouncing from one side of the room to the next, until finally settling on the double doors. They had a symbol, an emblem of some kind imprinted down the middle of them. Curious, I walked over to them to get a better look. The emblem on the white door was golden, almost looking imperial-like. It resembled a face. No, maybe it was a flower. It was surrounded with what appeared to be a wavering cloak of some kind. Did it have to do with their religion? Still curious, I glanced over to the door where the man had disappeared behind. Finally, I returned my eyes back to the double doors. They had fairly large bar handles, acting as the knobs. I was hesitant, but I slowly reached out to one of them, and when my hand made contact with it, I felt a hint of warmness. This was peculiar because the room was cold, so how was this likely? The handle felt as if some had held it just recently, perhaps minutes ago. I jerked back on it, but the door didn't budge. I tried a few more times, but was unsuccessful. It was locked. I looked around to see if there was a keyhole. Maybe I could peek inside. Instead, I found a small indent next to the handle. The indent was no bigger than a quarter, maybe. Must be the lock? I looked closer to see that it had a similar design as the emblem engraved on the inside. Feeling defeated, I made my way over to one of the chairs and sat. Hopefully the man wouldn't be any longer. Probably for the best that it didn't open, though. My first day on the job and I was already snooping around. I was actually glad the man didn't catch me attempting to break in like that. That stunt could have had my ass sent home, especially since he had already seemed to be an uptight jerk. That had happened. My boss would have had a field day on me for blowing such a high-paying opportunity. The man eventually returned from the back with a large ring of keys in his hand. He hastily ushered me to follow, grabbing my luggage and proceeding to the door on the right. Just as he had mentioned, there was a staircase on the other side. The area appeared more on par with the outside appearance of the building, looking pale and decayed. Every step we took was followed by a long-winded creak. I was sure that at any moment they'd give out on either of us. But they never did. We reached the top and came to a long, dimly lit hallway with another red carpet. Except this was long enough to run to the end. The doors in the hallway appeared adjacent and parallel to each other. Electric candles illuminated the area from the walls in between the doors. The man led me halfway down before halting at the door on the right. This is your room, he stated, unlocking the door. The door produced a loud creak as he opened. I braced myself, expecting to find a poorly conditioned room, but was met with an agreeable sight instead. It was similar in appearance to the lobby. Plain with pearly white walls, a large king-sized bed sat neatly near the window. Blanket and sheets and even a pillow were already provided. In the corner sat a sturdy wooden desk with a brass lamp on it. A tall bookshelf was leaning against the wall, empty of book, with a smaller dresser to its side. The room looked very comfortable. The thought of staying in it for a few days was very appealing. The man placed my luggage near the dresser. You can put your clothes up in here. Breakfast is at 8, lunch is at 12, dinner's at 6. Sharp, he stated, handing me a key from the ring. You're welcome to wear whatever pleases you to the meals, and just make sure that you're not late. We don't start eating until everyone's present. 8, 12, 6, I repeated. Got it. By the way, Mr. Pale, I was interested to know how you propose to conduct your work without any of your supplies. He asked before leaving. I chuckled to myself. Oh yeah, sorry. I, uh, <laughs> I, I forgot to mention all the equipment is in the trunk of my car. He gave me an unsettling glare and held out his hand. Your car keys, please. I returned him an unassured look, but quickly handed them over when I saw his glare tighten. I'll return your keys once I have acquired everything that y'all need from your car. The Reverend informed me that you don't need to conduct any work until tomorrow, so please enjoy the rest of your evening. Move your supplies into the office downstairs. You find the office after heading into the door on the left. It's on the way to the dining area. See you at dinner, he said. 
shutting the door behind me. With that, I was left alone once again. The quietness of the room left me with a dull, numbing sensation. For a second, I was lost in its trance until the moaning of the building from the wind awakened me. Once out of it, I turned my attention back to the room. Certainly, it must have been recently refurbished. I ran my fingers along the surface of the desk, and just from sight alone I could tell its history dated back with the building. Even so, it felt like it truly belonged despite its age. I made my way over to the window looking below. I could see my car, but no sign of the man. I shrugged it off. He could take as long as he wanted, as long as he didn't break anything, I thought. I smirked at this and turned my attention back to inside. My eyes fell on the bookshelf. Although it was empty, several imprints from books could be seen in between the dust. The size of the imprints indicated they must have been fairly large books. Near the edge of the shelf, I could see dragging marks as if someone had removed all the books, maybe in anger or perhaps in a hurry. That was probably done on purpose. I couldn't blame them. These people here seemed like the secretive type. They probably didn't want me looking through any of their texts. My eyes floated over to the bed. It looked very tempting. I wanted to just crash on it, but I knew I had to call my boss first. I promised him that I would inform him of any updates. Even though I hadn't started yet, I could at least inform him that I had arrived on time. I pulled out my phone. I checked the signal bar strength. It was hovering between one and none. This wasn't a surprise, considering where I was. I had played around with its positioning, first raising it higher, then side to side. I had no luck, though. I even tried holding it closer to the window, but still was unsuccessful. It was possible that it was just the room blocking the signal. So I made my way out into the hallway, keeping my phone stretched out, with my eyes fixated on it. I moved around the hallway aimlessly, still changing its position. Eventually, I realized how pointless it was. I decided to see if I had better luck outside. I went downstairs into the lobby, checking my phone along the way, feeling the frustration building up. I aimlessly swung it around, threatening to just toss the useless junk. Without warning, I was thrown off by a loud scream. Following it came a voice that yelled out, Hey, watch it! I was stunned, almost jumping out of my skin. The voice belonged to a young woman, a quite attractive one to say the least. Her eyes green flared at me in anger. She had auburn hair that curled around her face and over her eyes. She wore what appeared to be a black and green Victorian-style dress. The most eye-catching part of her was... She was pregnant. She had to be at least eight months by how her stomach extended through her gown. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... I stammered quickly. I was trying to find my signal. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't getting any. Her glare softened and she smiled. She eventually let out a light giggle in my attempt to explain myself. Okay, okay, it's fine. You're forgiven already, she said. Voice. She had some sort of accent. Wasn't sure why, considering everyone here seemed to have a country one. You must be the technician that I've heard about. Uh, yeah, I said, blushing. Uh, you've, been, you've been hearing about me. Well, of course, she replied. They've been talking about you for weeks. Reverend Gary is especially excited. I'm Victoria Ruin, she said, holding out her hand for me to shake. I didn't stop blushing. Even when my hand met hers, it was smooth and felt frail to the touch. Aren't you going to tell me your name? She asked. Oh, uh, yeah, of course, I stammered. It's Marcus, uh, uh Marcus Pale. Well, Marcus Pale, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'll have you know that cellular reception is very poor out in these woods. You can, however, use our telephone. It's a landline connection and shouldn't give you any issues at all. I can take you to it if you'd like. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'd appreciate it, I replied, finally collecting myself. She began making her way to the hallway, beckoning me to follow with one hand. I caught sight of a large silver ring on her ring finger. I guess she was married. I mean, of course she was. A woman that beautiful ought to be married, I thought to myself. She led me through the door on the left, where I originally saw the man retrieve the keys. It led to a long hallway similar to the one upstairs. This hallway was narrower, housing fewer doors, all still shut. So tell me, Marcus, she began, where are you from? Uh, uh from Arlington, I answered. And where's that? She asked. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, it's Northern Virginia, I answered, blushing. Oh, that's quite all right, she said, giggling. I've never been up north before. You're lucky to have traveled around. All my life I've been here. Stuck here, that is. I've always wanted to venture out, but... 
But what? I don't know, it's nothing, she said, biting her lip. She came to a door on the left and opened it. Here we are. You can use this phone, she pointed inside. I thanked her and she entered. The room was tiny, just an upgrade from being considered a pantry. Inside was a small wooden table, clamped to back with an old phone. A single door sat to the side of a small window. A strong collection of breads coated the air, making the cramped space feel even more stuffy. I quickly dialed up my boss and informed him of the situation. He was glad to hear that I arrived all right and went to a speech about ensuring that I represented the company in the best manner possible. Afterwards, he told me to keep up the good work and to call him tomorrow. After hanging up, I was surprised to find Victoria still waiting for me in the hallway. Uh, You didn't have to wait for me, I told her. She smiled. Honestly, I have nothing better to do. I've been cooped up in my room for the longest time because of this bloody baby. Oh, I said. I couldn't think of any response. You don't talk much, do you? She asked, still smiling. I shrugged sheepishly. What can I say? I'm a quiet guy. Well, it's a change for sure. You're different from all the men around here. All they do is talk and lecture, and they they expect all the woman to do is just listen. (laughs) It's quite maddening at times. They're all men of the North like you. I blushed at this. Are you the only woman here? I asked, attempting to change the subject. She scoffed. Of course not. I don't know what I'd do if I was. There's two others. Aunt Margaret and Cousin Sophia. You'll meet them later at dinner. You're coming, of course. Her emerald eyes gleamed into my own. I could feel my heart rate slowly increase. My face must have been bright red from blushing. (laughs) Yeah, of course I will. Her smile widened. I've been bored of the past few days. You want to go on a little adventure? Adventure? I repeated. Yeah, I could give you a tour of the place. I'm sure you're wondering where everything is. I really hadn't thought about the place as a whole. The only area that vaguely interested me was the room behind the double doors, but... I didn't feel comfortable asking her. Sure, why not? I answered. Good, she said, wrapping her arm around mine. Where do you want to go first? Her perfume engulfed me, smelling of sweet berries and honey and the smell that was perfect for her. You want me to decide? Yeah, of course. I don't want to bore you, show you every nook and cranny, she answered. I could tell she was reading my face because she added, Come on! I know there's a place you're dying to explore. Oh, well, I started. Yeah? Just spill it already! I I did kind of want to see what was behind the doors in the lobby, I replied, rubbing my neck in shame. Doors? Oh, you mean the congregation room? Yes. I mean, if, if I can, I understand. Nonsense! Let's go! She said, yanking my arm, pulling me until we reached the lobby again. Victoria? I asked as she made her way to the door. Yes? That symbol on the door. Um, what is it? She glanced over to the doors. This is the symbol of our religion. Well, uh, their religion anyway. I've grown tired of all their prayers and sermons. It's it's all rubbish, really. Rubbish. (laughs) But if you don't care for it, then why are you here? No, you're right. I I don't. I never was into it. Ever since I was a little girl, my father forced me to be a part of it. All I have ever known has been the Herb Peach County. Uh, Apart from my brief stay in the UK. I'm sure you can tell I don't exactly sound like I'm from around here. Yeah, I I noticed. You have my aunt to thank for that. Anyway, I've grown really tired of all of it. Like I said earlier, I have to venture out and see the rest of the world. At least my home country. I can't even remember it anymore. So your aunt brought you here. What about your mother? What did she have to say about this? She chuckled softly to herself. I have no memory of my mother. My father told me that she died after I was conceived. I was mainly raised by my aunt. Oh, I'm sorry, I replied softly. I I know the feeling. My mother died when I was young, too. We went quiet for a while. Um... Why don't you just leave? I suggested, breaking the silence. I mean, you're not a little girl anymore, right? So you don't have to stay here now. She smiled. If only it was that simple, Marcus. <laughs> I would love to leave, but... Some things aren't that simple. She was looking down. 
rubbing her belly. Oh, I started. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, um... I felt like a complete idiot. My talent for making awkward moments worse was starting to emerge. I, I was bad at this kind of thing, and even worse at comforting someone. It was mainly the reason why I remained so quiet. Come on, let's not ruin our tour with my story. She interrupted, making her way to the door. <laughs> yeah, I said, still feeling guilty. Without even thinking, I asked, So how do we get in? It's locked, right? A smile returned to her face. She turned, giving me off a joking, suspicious expression. How did you know it was locked? I shrugged, pathetically giving off a sheepish grin. I don't know. Aren't most doors in this place locked? It was a poor excuse. I knew it. Uh-huh. You're more audacious than you make yourself out, Mr. Marcus Pale, she said, placing her ring into the small indent. She twisted her wrist to the right, which prompted a soft click. Your ring is a key? I asked in astonishment. What? Does the North not have keys like these? She teased, pulling open one of the doors. Come on. I followed behind the door. Inside the room was huge. The sweet aroma of the lobby seemed to fall flat, sucking out when the door shut. Immediately, the singe of smoke and ash filled the room. The lighting was very poor. What little light was present came from the cracks of the door behind us. The room had long hues of seating lined in rows. The rows made their way to the front of the room where they stopped and before an altar, and from there, a small set of stairs ran up to a large podium. Behind it was a flat table on the altar. The table itself was covered in a, in a white cloth. Near the walls stood tall columns of rigid rock, as if crudely carved, connecting to the ceiling. In between them stood small marble pillars, each housing a brass bowl. What was this place? I must have spoken the question out loud because Victoria answered me. It's a congregation room, silly. Something burning in here? Yeah, it's from the candles. That's when we're doing our services due to the poor lighting. Why not just install lights? Well, candles are also an important part of our service, she said, almost as if I was supposed to know this already. I diminished it, though, and went through. I climbed up the stairs to the altar, noticing a figure standing beside the podium. It was hard to make out in the shadows. If it wasn't for the strands of light behind us, I, I wouldn't have even noticed it. I took up my phone and I held it up to the figure, using its backlight. What I saw almost caused me to tumble down the stairs. In front of me, I saw a tall, white statue depicting a strange figure well over my height. Its upper body was a very fit man, wearing a strong chest and arms. The arms of the statue hung low, sweeping near its ankles. It only had three fingers. The legs appeared inverted, its knees caved inward like a goat's legs, and even more disturbing was the head of the statue. It was a hard sight to bear. The head... The head looked to be a sick crossbreed between a dog and a man. It wasn't like the typical depiction seen in Egypt, no, this... This head was like a dog and a man simultaneously. It had a long, narrow snout that seemed to morph into a mouth of a man. Other parts of its face appeared human-like, while in others, indescribable. The eyes were small and beady, staring firmly off into the distance. It held a third eye larger in comparison to the other two in the middle of its forehead. Long, wild hair ran down its face, ending at its shoulders with horns protruding from its back. The statue as a whole stood in a confident pose as if knowing its presence was significant. Victoria? I felt my voice squeak. I could hear an eerie chill fall down my spine, unable to tear my eyes from the horrid view. What, uh, what, what is that? I stammered. Walking to me, her eyes carried over to the figure. She seemed unfazed and calm. That is our god. Lanius. The white eye of time. What's wrong, Marcus? 
Toya asked. You look absolutely pale. Are you frightened? The light from the cell phone I had dropped reflected back into my face. Even with its light in my eyes, I could still make out the horrid figure looming above me. What did she say? You're God? I stammered. You worship that thing? I asked, still unable to peel my eyes from it. I took a few steps back, losing my balance in the process. Instantly, I fell back, slamming into the seated hues behind me. Sharp pain erupted from my back as I could feel the rush of air painfully forcing its way out of my mouth. I guessed it was true that the wind could literally be knocked out of you. I remained still, feeling the pain surge from my back. Marcus, you alright? Victoria asked question to my side. Are you hurt? Instantly, there was a loud slam from a door behind us, flooding the room with a bright light. What in the hell is going on in here? An angry voice yelled out. Victoria popped up. Nothing! We were doing a little touring when Marcus had a tumble. She said, addressing the voice. Marcus! The voice responded in surprise. You brought an outsider into our area of worship. I could hear the voice's steps move at high pace until they halted next to us. My eyes hadn't completely adjusted to the light yet, so all I could see was a partially lit figure. A man, at least. Didn't matter who it was, though. They sounded angry regardless. This could be the moment I was going to be sent home. You fell! I'm not sure if he's injured himself or not, Victoria continued. The man sighed. He does look pretty banged up. Hey, can you at least move? He asked, looking down at me. I hadn't tried yet, but I attempted to move my arms and my legs. Despite the lingering pain from my back, nothing appeared to be broken. I, th I think I'll be all right, I replied weakly. I slowly began to stand, feeling the man helping me up. Are you all right, Marcus? Victoria asked again. He'll be all right, the man said, helping me towards the light of the door. When my eyes eventually adjusted, I could finally make out their faces. It was Terrence. After reaching the exit, he shut the door to the room behind us. It felt good to be out there, back in the coolness of the lobby. Apparently I'd been sweating because I could see the large spots across my chest. Now look here, I know you're our guest and all, but I'm going to need you to end your little exploring he said to me, before turning his attention over to Victoria. As for you, you ought to know better. Matter of fact, you should be resting. We're lucky that didn't happen to you now with that baby. No more exploring. Else things like this happen, he said sharply. It felt like we were both being scolded as if we were children. Just remember, you're here for a job, he said, returning to me. So if you just stick to that, you'll be fine. Yeah, best go and wash up. Dinner will be ready soon. Bathroom's at the end of the hall on the left. Just make sure you knock before you enter. Go on now. I nodded weakly, catching Victoria's apologetic eyes as I turned to leave. I wasn't mad at her for what had happened. How could I be? It was my own fault for clumsily falling like I did. I made my way back upstairs and cleaned up. By the time I finished, the time was 6.03 p.m. I knew Terrence had told me not to be late, but... I didn't want to be the first one to show up either. I cut it too close and hastily made my way back down, heading through the doors on the left in the lobby. Coursing through the hallway, I caught the hint of food in the air. The smell gradually increased the closer I drew to the other side. By the time I had reached the end, my stomach was beginning to growl and protest. Even my mouth began to water. I approached a pair of double doors and I could see light coming through its cracks. Behind them, I could make out murmuring of voices. This was it, I thought. I took a deep breath and I pushed open the doors. The dining room on the other side was big, like fancy big. The vibe I felt reminded me of the formality back in the old days, early 1900s maybe. Several antique cabinets stood up against the walls. They had glass doors with the insides filled with priceless looking treasures. Portraits ran along the walls portraying the faces of people, possibly ancestors of the sort their eyes firmly staring forward as if a silent audience to the event. In the center of the room, a large table sat filled bountifully with plates, mountains of food and drinks. The other residents of the church could be seen standing around the table, chatting amongst themselves. However, their chatting ceased when the doors shut behind me. They all gazed at me silently. My nerves were through the roof, so I just stood there like a deer caught in headlights. What now? I thought. Finally, one of the women spoke out at me. 
Ah, you must be Marcus. Welcome, my dear. She had a British accent like Victoria's, and I quickly assumed that this had to have been her aunt. She was most likely in her mid-forties in a face lightly stained with wrinkles. She had dark hair tied neatly in a bun, and wore a dress similar to Victoria's, but with more red in it. I'm Margaret. Pleased to meet you, she said, walking up to me. After shaking my hand, she guided me over to the others around the table. There were four others. One was a woman she introduced me to be Sophia, apparently the cousin Victoria had mentioned. I was surprised to hear that she didn't exhibit the same accent as either of the two. Instead, had the same country one as the Reverend. She was much younger than Margaret and probably a few years older than me. The next person was Terence, who I had already met. From him was another man about the same age as him named Jesse. Lastly, she showed me Victoria. Couldn't hold back a smile when I saw her. She returned one as well. Margaret caught sight of this. I take you already met my niece, she stated with a teasing smile. <laughs> well, started beginning to blush. Yes, Victoria said. I was showing Marcus around earlier, trying to get him familiar with everything for when he starts his work. I see, Margaret replied. Well, come on now, dear. You sit over here. She led me to an empty chair near the end of the table next to her. Everyone else made their way behind their respective chairs, too. Victoria stood behind the chair across from my own. I was ready to pull the chair out and sit when I caught sight of her eyes beckoning me not to do so. I quickly corrected myself, realizing that everyone was still standing as well. When the Reverend arrives, we can begin eating soon, Margaret said. Please excuse him. He can run a little late sometimes. I chuckled a little to myself, thinking on Terence's words from before. However, it wasn't long until everyone's attention turned to the doors opposite the end of the table. I hadn't realized it was there. I was curious to where it led, probably to the Reverend's quarters. The door opened and the Reverend came walking through. He still had his hobbled walk from earlier, his face still pressed with the same toothy grin. When he came through, everyone spoke in unison. Evening, Reverend. His smile grew wider, at which he replied, Evening, everyone. He pulled out his chair and sat down, gesturing for everyone to join him. We all followed suit. The food before us was truly a sight. There was many dishes flooded gracefully with food, rice dishes, fresh-looking vegetables like corn and baked potatoes, sliced breads, and even three roasted meats. A large silver platter sat before everyone along with rows of forks and knives around it. I noticed the many wine bottles spaced around the table. The food looked simply amazing and I couldn't wait to eat was hesitant to make a move, unsure of their manner of etiquette, I decided to follow any and all actions of Victoria. It's probably the reason why she sat across from me. Let us bow our heads for prayer, the Reverend announced. My eyes shifted over to Victoria. She bowed her head with one eye open, pressing a finger to her lips while looking at me. Then she placed her hands together. I nodded and did so too. From then, the air was silent. I wasn't sure how much time had elapsed, but it felt long, at least five minutes. I opened one eye to check to see if everyone was still praying. Everyone, including the Reverend, still had their eyes shut. I could see all of them mouthing something silently to themselves. Margaret, I could see, was holding tightly to a charm from her necklace up to her forehead. I could only make out partial amounts of it, but I was sure that it was the same emblem as in the congregation room. I also noticed that everyone had a similar ring with Victoria, all on their ring finger. The rings each withheld the same emblem engraved within it. This made sense, since apparently they were keys to the room itself. I noticed Terence didn't have a ring on his finger. Instead, I saw it hanging from a necklace. When I looked at the Reverend, I saw that he had two rings. One was the same as the others, but the second one was different. I could tell the symbol wasn't the same. But the way his hands were positioned made it so I couldn't distinctly make it out. Amen, the Reverend finally spoke aloud. On command, everyone's eyes opened. Let us eat now, he said, raising his hands out. Everyone began grabbing at bowls or a plate, passing it around, filling their plate at their leisure. I was glad it was finally time to eat. I don't think my stomach could have taken another minute. I could feel my mouth watering even more, but I sat patiently, occasionally glancing over to Victoria for guidance. So, Marcus, the Reverend spoke out, Terence told me you took quite a tumble today. Hearing his voice gave me a jolt, snapping me out of whatever hunger trance I was in. Uh, uh, yes, sir, I managed to say. Oh, dear, are you all right? 
Margaret asked. You didn't hurt yourself too bad, did you now? Oh, no, I'm, I'm fine, I answered. A little sore, but I'll be alright. That's good to hear, Sophia added. Oh, where was this? Wouldn't want anyone else to do the same now. I swallowed a little, not wanting to explain that I had been somewhere I wasn't supposed to be. Somehow my eyes guided over to where Terence sat. The glare from them felt unsettling, as if this look alone was punishing me. He was in the congregation room, he said sternly without removing his gaze upon me. Say what now? Jesse replied, joining in. How did he manage to get in there? Oh, he was helped by Victoria, Terence announced without hesitation. The way he said it, though, it felt like he was dying to get it off his chest. It was like he was reporting a crime or something, expecting a reward. My eyes fell upon my plate, unable to meet anyone else's. I was unsure what would happen next at this point. Oh dear, Margaret said softly. Did you not have a candle on you, hun? She asked. I looked up quickly, surprised at her response. Victoria, she continued. You took him in there with no proper lighting. It's no wonder he banged himself up. I couldn't believe it. Here I thought I was going to hear a mouthful about invading their sanctuary, and instead they brushed it off like it was nothing. I glanced over at Terence, who appeared to be just as surprised by this reaction. Instead, he grumpily turned his attention to his plate, unable to look at me in defeat. I looked over at the Reverend, and he too seemed unfazed, still smiling. No, I wasn't thinking when I did, Victoria answered. However, we were doing fine without a candle. It was more from the statue that startled Marcus. Margaret and the others laughed at this. Oh, I was dreadfully frightened too when I saw that thing as a child. She replied. It is quite a sight at first, Marcus, but I assure you, when you learn about Lanius, you grow to truly understand him and what he is. I swallowed a little more at this. And what is he? I asked, leaning in a bit. Now, Margaret, the Reverend interrupted, chuckling a bit. We didn't bring the young man all the way up here to teach him a sermon. <laughs> Give the young man a chance to eat. Of course, Margaret replied with a giggle. Eat up, Marcus. We don't waste anything around here, she said, passing a bowl of potatoes. I felt my stomach growl again at the sight of them. I couldn't believe I'd forgotten about my hunger. I thanked her and I added it to my plate. I glanced over at Victoria, who gave me a slight nod of approval. I smiled and began receiving the other dishes being passed around. The night of the meal went by smoothly. There was chatter amongst everyone. I listened as they went on about their everyday occurrences. It was funny to hear them bickering at each other a few times. Occasionally, one of them would ask me a question or two about where I was from or what I did. By then, though, I didn't feel nervous anymore. After dinner, the Reverend dismissed everyone. On the way to my room, Victoria caught up with me. Marcus, she called out. I just wanted to apologize. For what? For how Terrence acted in there? I chuckled. That's fine. <laughs> I was just happy everyone else didn't feel the same way. Yes, well, Terence has always been that way. I'm just sorry that he tried to call you out like that. I'm fine, I said, blushing a little, trying to brush it off. He did the same to you too, I joked. We headed back upstairs, stopping when he arrived at my door. Well, good night, Marcus. Today was truly a pleasure. Good night, I replied. I watched her continue down the hallway, stopping a door on the left three away. She glanced my way when she saw that I was staring. Immediately, I snapped my head towards the door, unlocking it and closing it behind me. Inside, I smiled to myself. I quickly got dressed down to some shorts and a t-shirt and sat on my bed. I decided to look for any new messages on my phone. The screen lit up, revealing a surprising no-signal message. Of course, I thought, sarcastically. How could I forget? This place was a damn dead zone. I fell back, lying completely on my bed. Before I knew it, I was out. I awoke suddenly, blinded by light. Apparently I'd forgotten to turn off the lamp on the desk. Last thing I needed was them to complain about wasting their electricity. I slumped over to my feet to turn it off, and after doing so, I caught sight of something outside. Although I could make out my car in the moonlight, I could see that a clump of leaves had been blown over a lot of its roof. However... That's not what caught my attention. I could see a figure standing next to my car. Even with the moonlight, I could still not make out who it was. It did appear as if the figure was trying to enter into my car. I tried to focus my eyes better, but it still didn't help. 
I wanted to blame it on my tiredness, but my mind instantly thought about Terrence. Perhaps that jerk was still sore about dinner. He could have been trying to sabotage my car or something. I, I ran for my door, ripping it open, racing down the hall to the stairs, and when I reached the lobby, I stopped. The entire lobby was dark. In the air, I could smell a hint of something burning, like candles. I noticed a thin line of light in the congregation room's double doors. Completely forgetting about my car, I, I made my way to the doors. I could hear the slight murmur of voices from inside as I got closer. I pressed my ear up against the door to get a better listen, but I couldn't make out what the voices were saying. I could hear one voice speaking out loud. When it did, the other voices would speak in unison to the same rhythm. It was clear that they were repeating the message of the lead one. The tone and manner they spoke sent a chill down my spine. It was clear this was the church conducting their worship upon whatever that horrid image was that I had seen earlier. I didn't understand how they could worship such a thing, but then I didn't know how any religion could worship anything as they did. I decided to let them be and made my way back upstairs. They didn't seem like bad people, so how could I judge them based on what they believed? Victoria was a prime example of someone good from it. When I entered my room, I glanced out the window one last time, expecting to see something below. However, nothing was there. I shrugged it off. It was, it was possible there never was. I slipped back in my bed, and I fell asleep again. The next day, I was awoken by knocking at my door. I, I was su surprised to find Terrence on the other side. He apparently was ready for me to begin my work as soon as possible. When I checked my phone, the time read 6.30 a.m. It was a real dick move by him. Didn't even wake up this early for my job back home. Reluctantly, I bit my tongue and I told him that I'd be ready in 10 minutes. <sighs> After getting ready, he led me to the room where he had placed all of my equipment. The room had several old computers inside, like late 90s old. I hope they didn't expect the best performance on these dinosaurs. Nonetheless, I had a job to do. I immediately began setting up my equipment. I was even lucky to have company the whole time. Terrence saw that. Seriously, what's this guy's problem? Eventually, though, the time went by and even he got bored and left me. I was too happy when that happened. The day went by fairly quickly once I really got into my work. Of course, when the meal times came about, I attended them. A few times out of that day, Victoria came by to check on me. She'd forced me to take a break by walking around with her, which I didn't mind at all. Days continued to pass as I worked, each one becoming more routine. Throughout these days, I found myself spending more time with Victoria. I always looked forward to those break times I had with her. We'd walk around just talking and laughing, and most of the time we did so outside. I never thought I'd meet someone like her in a place like this. It made each day more doable. It's almost like our friendship was becoming more. I didn't mind if it didn't, but... And if it did, that was even better. There was something that bothered me, though. Every time we were together, it felt as if someone or something was watching us. I couldn't shake the feeling, even when I looked around, only to find nothing. I wanted to think nothing of it until one particular evening. After dinner, I came back to my room to find that someone had gone through my stuff. I hadn't transported any of my clothes from my bags to the dresser, feeling too lazy to do so. One of my bags had a Velcro strap to accompany the zipper for reinforcements. I knew I always kept the Velcro fastened. I was rather OCD about it. However, the Velcro was clearly unfastened and hanging loose. The first thought that ran through my mind was Terrence's doing, but I had no proof. It was possible that I was just looking for someone to blame. I never did confirm who it was by my car. If there really was someone. So I couldn't prove that it had been Terrence at all. I decided to look through the bag to be sure nothing was missing. I went through it all to find everything appeared to be there. I could tell my things were moved around a lot, but other than that, nothing. Clearly whatever the culprit was looking for, they didn't find. I couldn't lie, I was angry that someone had gone through my things. Was it really Terrence's doing? Did he really have something against me that much that he had to do all of this? Maybe I should confront him, I thought. No, the last thing I wanted to do was to start accusing people, which never looked good. I decided to let it slide. Just this once. I got into shorts and collapsed onto the bed. When I did so, I felt my head hit something hard. 
felt around the pillow, and instead of the usual fluffiness, I felt a hard texture. Someone had stuffed something. I reached inside and I, I pulled out the object. It was a thick, old, leathery book. I brought it over to the lamp on the desk to see it better. The cover looked hand-stitched to the spine. In the light, I could see a symbol engraved across in gold. It was the same one that I had seen everywhere. My hand began to tremble at the sight of this. How did this book get here? Who put it there? Why? I was hesitant, but I slowly opened it. it gave off a peculiar scent, smelling wet leaves and old tree bark. The pages were old and rather fragile. They were filled with text written in black ink. I couldn't comprehend the words. They were written in some strange language. It didn't even look like a language that should have existed. I continued to turn the pages, though. Seeing the text flood each one, a few pages in, I came across a picture. It was hand-drawn, no into detail. The picture depicted what looked to be a star. Around the star stood several figures, looking like people. One appeared slightly bigger than the others. I turned the page to find more text. I continued turning until finally I came across another picture. This one showed one of the human-like figures standing on what looked like a pedestal. The other human-like beings stood around the main one. Again, I flipped until I came across the next picture. Now, this picture showed the star from before. It looked bigger, but with squiggly marks shooting away from it. The human-like beings appeared to be cowering in fear, kneeling down at the star, even the big one from before. The picture after depicted the human-like beings falling from the sky their faces drawn in fear. The one I turned to after showed them drawn in a dark place, their faces twisted in despair. It then showed the human-like figures begin to change into hideous, deformed-like creatures. They had teeth and horns protruding from out of different parts of their bodies. The biggest one looked even worse than the rest, with eyes drawn angrily with sparks coming from its fang-filled mouth. Despite appearing like the drawings of an eighth grader, Images were really disturbing. Something about them made the hair on my neck rise. I wanted to stop, but my hands kept turning the pages, despite my mind's wishes. Despite appearing like the drawing of an eighth grader, the images were really disturbing. Something about them made the hairs on my neck rise. I wanted to stop, but my hands kept turning the pages, despite my mind's wishes. The next one showed one of the hideous beings straying from the others. It was smaller compared to them. The creature came across a man in the next one. It appeared to reveal a swirl-looking symbol to the man. The man appeared to walk through the swirl, but when he did, the creatures followed. A small child stood in front of the man in the next one. It was weird, but the two looked similar somehow. The creature appeared to possess the child's body, and when it did, the man fell to the ground, presumably dead. Now on the child's body, the child grew up. As it did, it showed the creature leave the man's body, depicting it underground, possibly sleeping. The man was seen surrounded by many people with others joining. Eventually, like before, it showed the creature awaken next to the man, showing him yet another swirl. Again, the man walked through that swirl with the creatures following, appearing in front of a child. Once again, it possessed the child, and the man died. The images repeated each time as they did. I noticed the creature's size growing bigger, and finally, I skipped further into the book to see where they led. The images revealed something different this time. Now it showed the man with a woman, the creature standing before her, and when I flipped to where the next image would appear, I found its page stuck tightly together to another. I tried to part them, but a tear began to form, threatening to ruin both pages altogether. I decided to skip it and move on to the next image, and my heart dropped when I did. This time the image showed a woman pregnant among a group of people from before. The images later went to show the woman in labor giving birth. The man appeared to have delivered the baby. However, it looked like no ordinary child. It was depicted to have large black eyes with long teeth, horns poking out in many directions. The child with its legs and arms disproportionate to each other. The man was holding the child in the air almost like he was, like he was glorifying it. 
At that moment, I couldn't take anymore, and I slammed the book shut. Tossed it to the other side of the room. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest, my arms and face sweaty. I, I shook my head in disbelief. There was no way, I thought. What the hell was all that even about? After seeing those images, I couldn't sleep for most of the night. All I could see was that horrid, inked image of those creatures. When I thought of the woman being depicted as pregnant, I couldn't help but think of Victoria. There was no way that it could have been her, could it? A lot of women can be pregnant. It's just a coincidence that it, ha it had to be. The next day, I worked sluggishly from lack of sleep. At breakfast, I made no eye contact with Victoria, nor did I talk to anyone else. If they asked, I simply blamed it on the headache or the tiredness. While working, I pleaded to myself, hoping Victoria would not come by as she usually did. Yet, despite my internal pleads, she came. Marcus, are you feeling any better? She asked, entering the room. I didn't respond. I didn't even look up. Marcus, are you alright? My silence caused her to press on. What's wrong? Why are you ignoring me? She asked. I could hear a hint of annoyance in her voice. Still, I gave her no answer. What could I say? All I could think was... Fine! She yelled and proceeded to leave the room. That child? I asked her without looking up. I could hear her footsteps come to a halt. What? Who's the father of your child? Is that what this is about? She asked. I stood up finally facing her. He was direct, but I had to know. My face, along with my silence, must have said it all for her. I could see the look of confusion in her eyes. Why does it matter? She asked harshly. I need to know. He stated firmly. I wanted it to be from her boyfriend, or even a, a deadbeat husband. Any of these were better than what I was thinking. Yet the entire time I had been there, I had not seen him, nor had there been any mention of him. She just stared at me with her mouth open, as if trying to find the words to speak. Tears formed in her eyes. They were gazing at me angrily, with sadness simultaneously. She shook her head softly, never taking her eyes from mine. Finally, she spoke. Stay away from me, Marcus. Never come near me or speak to me again, or, or I'll have you sent home. She stormed out, leaving me dumbfounded. My plan had backfired. I wanted to call out to her, stop her, and apologize, but again, I, I was at a loss for words. Like an idiot, I just stood there, with my head fall down in grief. As the day continued on, Victoria never returned to see me while I worked. At mealtime, she never made eye contact with me either, keeping her eyes focused on her plate. I felt horrible for what I did. I had no right to put her on the spot like that. I cursed at myself. After dinner, I attempted to talk to her as she was leaving for her room. She ignored me. I don't know why I thought knocking on her door would be any better. All I received upon it opening was having it immediately slammed in my face. I sighed, truly feeling utter regret, and I made my way back to my room. When I did, I sat on my bed. Staring off into space, I wish I had never found that damn book, that that everything between her and I would have been normal. I, I, I missed seeing her already, her smile, hearing her laugh, just being around her. I, I let my hand slide to my pillow to check for the book, only to find it missing. Stunned, I poured out the pillow's contents to find only feathers and cotton. I was sure I had put it back after I left each time. Was somebody messing with me? I angrily began searching for the book. I checked my suitcase, tossed clothes around as I did, checked the dresser, under the bed, and even behind the desk. Where was it? My eyes met the window when I came from under the desk. When I looked down, I saw the same figure from all those days before standing next to my car, and this time it appeared to be looking up at me. Anger filled me. I assumed it was Terrence again. This was a bad time for him to be messing with me. I raced out of my room and down the stairs. I ran around the side of the building to where my car was. The moonlight was stronger than ever, illuminating my way as I did, and when I reached my car, no one was in sight. I had finally reached a boiling point. You picked the wrong day to fuck with me, I yelled. Come on out, now! If not, leave me the hell alone! My voice echoed into the air before dying on the wind. The building gave off its unsettling moans. The leaves from the trees in the distance shook, rattling against their branches in the wind. There was no one out here. Feeling my mind grow at ease and realizing how much of a foul I looked. 
I started to make my way back. However, my nerves froze when I heard the snapping of twigs behind me. My heart began beating fast. I slowly turned around to see a figure gradually rising from behind my car. The figure was wearing a cloak with a hood over its head. In the light, I could see pieces of twigs and leaves sticking out of the cloak. I opened my mouth to scream, but the figure quickly darted over to me, covering my mouth with its hand. It hushed me softly. The voice was clearly a woman's. She slowly removed her hand from my mouth and made her way to the back of the building before disappearing behind it. She gestured for me to follow. I didn't want to, but my legs began to move on their own in her direction, and when I reached the other side, I saw her remove the hood from her head. The moonlight lit her face. She was an elderly-looking woman, possibly in her early fifties. She had ragged black hair mixed with gray strands that ran untamed. Her face was pressed with wrinkles with dry patches of dirt. The scent from her was rank but familiar. It smelled like wet leaves and old tree bark. Did you see it? She whispered. Her voice was crackly and rasp. You saw it in the book, right? You have to help me. You have to help me save my daughter. Who the hell are you? I asked, backing up from the woman. Please, she begged, grabbing my arm. The smell from her was more unbearable up close. Get off me, you old hag! I yelled, pulling myself free. She shushed me loudly. Her eyes appeared wide, scanning the area with paranoia. You want them to hear? Who will hear? What are you talking about? I asked. I'd only been a few minutes with her, and I'd already begun to become irritated. Them! She hissed. I could see the whites of her eyes gleam in the moonlight at her weak attempt to scare me. I shook my head, unmoved. I don't have time for this. I, I'm really tired, and I've got to get up early. Honestly, I, I don't care what you do out here, but just stay away from my car. I don't want to catch you near it again, or else I'll, I'll report you. No, please don't, she begged, ready to grab at me again. However, I was unable to avoid her clawing hands this time. Fine, I shot back. Just don't... Don't touch me again! I'm leaving now. As I turned to leave, I could see the woman's head sulk to the ground. Normally this would have been the part where I would have felt sorry. But right now I didn't care. I was too tired with my mind, overwhelmed with the events that had transpired throughout the day. Besides, she was clearly deranged in the head, possibly homeless, or maybe one of those people who lived off the land. I started to walk away when it hit me. I thought about what else she had said earlier. I looked back to still see her eyeing the ground, almost appearing in a trance. I was reluctant to go back, but I had to know. What did you mean, your daughter? How did you know about the book? I asked, approaching her. Without looking up, she answered, My daughter. I need your help to save her. Your daughter? Who's your daughter? You already know of her. Why do you ask me? She replied, looking up at me. Her eyes relayed a look of solemn. I need to hear it from you, I said. I was sure I knew the answers that she mentioned, but something inside me wanted to hear those words come from her. I wanted to be absolutely sure. Say her name. It's Victoria, of course, she said softly. I shook my head in disbelief. But how? You're her mother, but... But you're supposed to be... She said you died when she was a child. Is that what she told you? She scoffed. It would be like Gary to tell her such a lie. What? Yes, she said stiffly. He took her from me. But I didn't want to submit to his religion. He banished me. Well, this couldn't be possible. Victoria's mother was dead, right? But how would I know otherwise? I did notice when I listened closely I could hear her accent hidden behind her raspy voice. Wait, th this man you're talking about, I started. It couldn't have been the same person. D do you mean the Reverend? She didn't answer me immediately. Instead, her eyes wandered off into the trees beyond, but eventually her head gave a soft nod. 
they saw it. Look, you said to help your daughter and that the Reverend took her. Why didn't you just go to the police or something? She chuckled to herself lightly, returning her eyes to mine. You don't know these people. I don't know anything, because you're not telling me everything, I replied harshly. My impatience had elevated to annoyance. All you need to know is that the people you think you know are liars. The Reverend is the worst of them all. They need my daughter. They made her a part of their revolting ritual. I should have never brought her here. I was so weak-minded back then. Damn them, she spat bitterly. I didn't know what to do, but then I, then I saw you arrive. At first, I was unsure what to think of you, yet while watching you with Victoria, I knew it would be you who would help me to do what I couldn't. Take her away from all of this. It all started to come together. All those times it felt like something or someone was watching me had been her, yet still confused. She hadn't really answered my question and only contributed to the pile of others. That's a lot to believe, especially about the others. They don't act the way you make them out to be. Besides, what ritual are you talking about? I asked. You're very fond of her, aren't you? She asked, ignoring my question. Of oh, Victoria. What? I blurted out. I could feel my cheeks reddening. I'm glad that you are, she said, smiling. It does my heart good to see another care for Victoria as I do. This is the reason why I knew you'd help me, but I had to show you first of what, what they plan to do, what they've already done. I left that book in your room as proof you saw it, so you now know too. I was thrown off again. I couldn't believe that she was behind the placement of the book as well. Wait a second. I I don't even know what I saw in that book. I couldn't even read the words. You don't need the words. You saw the pictures, didn't you? She shot back. You saw what's been done. I didn't know what to think. The images on those pages were indeed horrific. I wanted to believe, but another part didn't want to accept it. You mean to tell me that what's going on in Victoria is... is... I couldn't finish the words. What can you expect from me, then? It seems a bit... too late now. There is one thing we can do. I can dispel the ritual, stop it before it is ever completed, and that evil is born. But why haven't you done it already? Because... She began. Because I need access to their room of worship. And last I checked, I lost my key. She held up her hand for me to see. I could make out a small stump where her ring finger had used to be. Wow. Oh. Rings are more than a show. Sure, you know that by now. They are keys. But there's a darker secret behind them. They are also a symbol to show your allegiance to the faith by permanently clamping onto the wearer's finger. The only way to remove it is by removing the finger entirely. When they banished me, I was so torn that, that I bit off my own finger. I didn't want anything on me that was associated with them. That's... that's crazy was all I could say. I couldn't fathom someone wanting to risk their finger or any part of their body on the basis of their faith or anything. I've heard of tattoos, but this was way beyond that. I couldn't help but picture the woman clamping down on her finger until it snapped, spitting it out. The very thought made my stomach turn. Yes, but it was only after so that I wished I hadn't could have ended this nightmare years ago, yet I let my anger cloud my judgment. But you're here now, which which means there's hope again. Me, I replied. I don't I don't have a ring either. I know. But the others do, she said, smiling. Do you know Terence? I gritted my teeth. How could I not? Prick, 
and muttered, Terence is a lapdog when it comes to the reverend and the faith, but he's too much of a, of a pansy to wear the ring like the others. He keeps his on a necklace he wears. I've seen it, I replied, recalling the times at dinner. How am I supposed to get it if it's on him? This is where you come in perfectly. You probably don't see much of everyone throughout the day. That's because there are chores to be done to keep the place up and running. Terence is a working man. He normally chops up wood or fetches game for the meals. When he bathes afterward, he takes off the necklace. I know this because I used to do the sheets around the living quarters and would see his ring just lying there. This is the best time to do it. He never locks his door at that time either. If you can take his ring at that moment, bring it to me and I will do the rest. I bit my lip thinking on it. I, I, I don't know. It seems a bit risky. If, if I get caught, I'm finished and he'll, he'll have me sent home instantly. Then don't get caught. You're the only one who can walk around here easily. If I could do it, I would, but they'd see me on first sight. I was barely able to place the book in your room. Please, you have to do this. For Victoria. It gave off another long sigh before conceding. With that, a smile formed wider than it had ever been on her face. I could see the many crooked rows of her blackened and yellow teeth. Good, she said, leaning close to me. I've been watching Terrence for a while. He's already chopped off a round of logs good for now, but he'll need to do so again. He does it every two days, so the day after tomorrow you'll have to make your move. As she explained, I nodded. Once I get it, how will I contact you? Where will I find you? She paused for a moment before answering. Your lamp. If you're able to get the ring, then turn your lamp on and leave it on. I'm always watching, so I'll see it. I nodded. Then what? I'll be fine. I've survived this long, so don't worry about me. You should go now. We don't want anyone catching wind of you out here. Yeah. Yeah, right. I agreed. Turning to leave. There's one more thing I need to tell you, the old woman said. What is it? I asked. I need you to promise to never mention this meeting to Victoria. She must never know you've seen me. What? But Victoria would be thrilled to know you're alive. I know she would. Which is why she can't know that I am. Or else she won't want to leave. Can you do that for me? I heard her voice quiver off. Her eyes become glossy in the moonlight. I swallowed hard and nodded. She returned a grateful nod and faded until I could no longer see her among the shadows. I shivered a little. The chill of the wind was finally getting to me. So I quickly ran back inside and back up to my room. The following day I started early, as usual, for my work. Throughout it, I thought about the plan. Regardless of how I felt, I knew that I had to make it work. I also knew I had to stall my overall progress. So I made sure to inform Terence that I would need a few extra days to complete it. My boss didn't pick up when I called, so I left him a message. I made up a BS excuse about needing more time to set up and ensure the system was functioning correctly. After lunch, I proceeded to head to my room to take a nap. Normally, I would have spent this time with Victoria. When I unlocked my door, I heard a grunting sound. Sound was subtle at first and appeared to be coming from the end of the hallway. I paused for a moment, unsure if I had actually heard something. I was ready to shrug it off until I heard it again, but a little louder. Curious, I made my way down the hallway, listening as I did. I stopped at the door I presume it came from and pressed my ear up against it. I heard it again. I took my ear away. This was Victoria's door. Hesitant, I knocked on it lightly. Uh, hey, are you alright in there? I asked. There was no answer. Victoria? Uh, it's me, Marcus. He continued. I could hear rapid breathing from inside, sounding like 
hyperventilating. It didn't sound good. Frantically, I knocked on the door with a little more force. Victoria, are, are you all right? What's going on in there? Uh, can you let me in, please? Go away! I heard her say in between gasps. I sighed and pressed my head softly up against the door. Look, I understand you don't want to talk to me. And I I don't blame you. I, okay, I have no right to... I, I was a jerk back there. I shouldn't have been trying to pry as I did. In truth, I didn't care about your baby or who the father is. I, I never did. See, I just... I wanted you to know that I... The words again failed me. I could see them in my mind, but I couldn't push them out. I'm sorry. I forced out. I wanted to tell her something else. About how I felt about her. About everything. But the timing didn't feel right. I, I turned to leave, but stopped when I heard the door open behind me. She had it half-cocked to allow her face to peer through. She stared at me for a moment as if analyzing my eyes for truth. And finally she opened it fully, walking back into her room. I followed her, closing the door behind me. Her room was nice, unlike mine which was bland and almost empty. Her room was more... cozy. She had a desk filled with books, some open journals, others maybe novels. Her mini dresser was complemented with a vase filled with several flowers, clearly well cared for. Her mini dresser was complemented with a vase filled with several flowers, clearly well cared for. The scent of her perfume lingered in the air. I embraced its smell. A scent I long missed. What was the noise I heard earlier? I asked. Uh, I thought something was wrong. She walked over to her bed and sat, making a painful face as she did. I'm fine, she said gravely. It's just this bloody baby's all. I joined her on the bed. I meant what I said out there. Uh, I don't care about it. You, you don't have to tell me about it at all, either. She kept her gaze away from me, but I could see tears forming in her eyes. Shut up, Marcus, she said with a quivering lip. Just shut up. She broke down in tears, cupping her face with her hands. I was bad at handling these kinds of moments. They always felt like they left me feeling awkward, but I gradually reached over to her shoulder to comfort her. She immediately threw herself on me, bawling her eyes out on my chest. And after a good solid five minutes, she had finally stopped. Her eyes were reddened. Her nose slightly runny. You said your mother died when you were young, she finally said. How did she die? I sighed. She, um... She was... She was killed. I answered after a long pause. Some guy um, broke into their apartment and shot her. Marcus, she said. I'm so sorry. That must have been devastating for you. Yeah, well, um... I don't remember when it happened. Like I said, I was too young. I could feel her sob a little more on my chest. It's my father, she finally said, leaning on my shoulder. Father, I repeated, confused. Yeah, yes. He did this to me, she said. Looking down at her stomach. My eyes widened as I pulled away. Y your father did this? Who is he? Who do you think? She said harshly, wiping her eyes. I thought about it for a second and immediately my eyes flashed. The Reverend? Wait, the Reverend is your father? I asked. I couldn't believe it. Her, her mother said he took Victoria from her, but mentioned nothing about him, about him being the father as well. Victoria nodded, but then shook her head. He's my stepfather. My mother met him after my real father died. 
If he did this, why didn't you tell anyone? Because I couldn't prove it. He drugged me or something, I don't know. At first, I didn't want to say anything, but when I started showing signs of the baby, he went on to tell everyone that it was a miracle, that I was a gift from Linnaeus. And like English sheep, they questioned nothing, taking in his poison words, but I knew the truth because he was the only one, only one there. A few more tears fell down her cheeks. I bit my lip when she said this. This part sounded all too familiar. I thought about the book and the image of the man standing with the woman. That hoarded figure behind her. Was it all true, though? She had no memory of the event. Was it possible that this sick action was all just the reverend's doing? Regardless of which, Victoria's mother was right. These people were monsters. If not that, ignorant. At this point, I wanted to cheer her up. I thought about telling her everything about her mother, but remembered the promise that I had made. Instead, I lifted her chin so that her eyes were looking into my own. I... I can take you away from this. All we have to do is jump into my car and leave. You'll never have to see this place again. I could see a mixture between happiness and fear in her eyes. How? Where would we go? You'd stay with me. I have my own place. It's safe. Trust me. Marcus. She spoke softly. A smile gradually formed on her lips. <laughs> yes. Yes, let's do it. She said, rendering me a tight hug. We should leave tonight. Tonight? I repeated. Yes. After dinner, any earlier and they'll become suspicious. They always hold their sermons late at night, which gives us enough time between them. We can leave then. I looked away, trying to find a way to convey my thoughts. I didn't want to reveal the plan or her mother. What's wrong, Marcus? Uh, how about tomorrow night? Tomorrow? Why? Why do we have to stay here another day? Let's leave tonight. No, I... No, it has to be tomorrow night. I quickly shot back without thinking. Marcus, I don't understand. Is there something you're not telling me? I placed my hands on her shoulders firmly, looking her in the eyes. Look, you have to trust me. I have a plan with... a friend. They're willing to help, but it has to be tomorrow. Okay? Her eyes were full of so much confusion. I knew she thirsted for answers, but luckily she simply nodded. Okay. I trust you. For a second, I began to lean in for a kiss. When we were both startled by an abrupt knocking at the door, I answered it. You discover Sophia on the other side. Mr. Pale? She said surprisingly. We are beginning to worry about you when we didn't find you in your workspace. Her eyes shifted as a gaze between me and Victoria. I trust I wasn't interrupting anything. Uh, no, I said, trying to maintain my composure. I was just, um, I was checking in on Victoria. I turned back to give her a wave and slid past Sophia. Heading down, I glanced down the hall to see her in Victoria's doorway. I didn't want to arouse suspicions, so I continued on and back to the room I was working in. I was so glad that I had patched things up with Victoria. The feeling helped ease my thoughts on the plan. I wondered if we could really pull it off. Leaving the place was one thing, but stealing the ring from that jerk was another. Something broke this mood, though. I was heading back to continue my work when I caught the sight of Terence walking outside with an axe over his shoulder. That was strange. There's probably nothing to worry about. The old woman said he chopped every two days. He would still need to do it tomorrow. He probably needed it for something else, I assured myself, though the thought wasn't that reassuring. I decided to keep my eye on him while I worked, just in case. I looked towards the trees, hoping to maybe catch sight of the old woman, but I didn't see anything. I didn't actually believe I would see her, since she had managed to keep herself invisible for years. I was sure, though, that she too was watching everything. 
I continued working until Sophia came to me. She informed me that my boss had called and was waiting on the phone. Great. Perfect timing as usual, I thought grumpily. What did he want, anyway? She led me back to the phone where I found it setting off the hook on its side. Apparently he was following up on the message I left and wanted to ensure that I was making progress. I told him that I would have everything up soon, hoping to end the phone call quickly. I noticed a small window in the room and peered out of it. Stretching the phone line as I did, I gazed out into my horror. I saw Terrence making his way back. His shirt was fully soaked in sweat, while he was pushing a wheelbarrow full of chopped logs. After dumping the logs off, he made his way around to the front. I felt my heart leap into my throat. In my ear, I could hear my boss going on in another one of his speeches about representing the company. Fuck the company right now, I thought. I had a small window of opportunity, and I was about to miss it. We were completely wrong. I could already hear Terrence slam the front door and proceed up the stairs. I quickly thought of a way to let my boss allow me to hang up, lying that one of my clients had asked for help. Once over, I raced out of the room, nearly smacking into Margaret on the way. Goodness me! You're running as fast as a fire spurred, she exclaimed. I apologized frantically, my eyes looking down the hallway behind her. Is everything all right, dear? She asked with a puzzled look. Yeah, I lied. I just need to... I need to... Uh, use the bathroom really bad. Oh... Well, I shouldn't keep you, she replied, holding her hand up to her mouth. I thanked her and raced towards the stairs, stopping immediately before reaching the top. I cautiously peeked down the hallway. No one was in sight. Where was he? Was he already in his room, or did he... Did he enter the bathroom? I crept up the last remaining steps slowly, eventually making my way down the hall. I could hear the sound of water running in the background. Yes! He was in the shower, but for how long? Knowing I didn't have much time, I sped my pace until I reached the door. I opened it quickly, shutting it behind me. Surprisingly, his room was a lot like mine. There wasn't much in it. It was bland and almost empty. Anything he did have, like books, were nicely organized in its place. I began looking around, making sure to return anything I moved back to its original place. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. Every sound I heard, whether creak or thump, I associated with it being Terrence. I felt like my senses had amplified. I found myself constantly looking towards the door in paranoia, thinking he'd barge through at any minute. I looked through his dresser and all around his bookcase, but found nothing. I started searching the desk, pulling open drawers to see inside, and when I opened the last drawer, I froze. Inside, I could make out a familiar object. A gun. It was a revolver. I didn't... I didn't know the specifics, but it had a very long barrel. I could see the dust that had formed over it clearly. It hadn't been touched in quite a while. I shut the drawer and continued searching around. In the end, I couldn't believe it. The ring wasn't there. But how could it be? I wanted to check over everything again, but a feeling inside urged me to leave. I listened to it and left the room, gently closing the door behind me. I started to head back to my room until I heard a voice call out. Oi! I heard, freezing my nerves. I almost shouted in complete terror out of shock. I turned to see a half-robed Terrence dripping in the hallway. A towel was wrapped around his waist, soaking up what little water dripped from his wet body. His sweaty clothes were tightly gripped in a ball in one hand, while the other held his shoes. What are you doing down here? He asked sternly. My heart was now knocking against my chest, as if wanting to burst out. I just needed to use the bathroom. I lied. I, I, di I, didn't, I didn't realize someone was in... Until I got down the hall. Terrence squinted hard at me as if trying to figure me out, but finally gestured to the bathroom with his head. Well, it's free now, he said. I thanked him. I made my way past him. I pushed open the door to the small bathroom, and immediately my eyes lit up. There, sitting on the sink, was the necklace with a ring attached. He had it with him all along. I was close to reaching for it until I heard someone behind me. There's a blasted thing, Terrence said, moving past me and grabbing it. All right, all yours now for real, he said. He left. Couldn't believe it. The plan had failed. I wanted to punch the wall or something, even scream out loud, yet when I really thought about it, there was no chance of getting away with it freely. Even if he had left the room, he would have immediately noticed. There wouldn't have been enough time to give to the old woman and leave with Victoria, especially if we planned to leave in the evening. I sighed and I began my long walk of defeat back. 
What can I tell the old woman now? You didn't have an alternate plan. I continued heading downstairs and decided to go back to work. Maybe I could think of something while I did so. Dinner eventually came by and still, I had no idea what to do. I was sure the old woman had seen my lamp was still off. Or lay the failure of the plan. I wondered if she'd possibly come up with a solution of her own. Marcus, how far along are you with your work? Margaret inquired, pulling me from my thoughts. I heard there were minor delays. Uh, well, I should have everything up and running by tomorrow, I answered. Oh, well, that's a dreadful thought. We're going to miss having you around. You're almost like a member of the family now, she said, giving off an unsettling giggle. I've actually been meaning to ask why you needed this service anyway. It doesn't seem like you really need it, I brought up. On the contrary, my boy, the reverend spoke. Our faith is a rare breed, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any other inspiring souls out there. We want to be able to reach any and all potential followers with your help. We can do that and upload our sermons for all to see. Oh, I said. Okay. The mere thought of them uploading footage and their worshipping made me feel uneasy. Plus, it brought you to us, Marcus. Having a young lad such as yourself has been truly a pleasure. I smiled sheepishly and glanced over to Victoria. She appeared to be squinting in pain. Are you all right, my dear? Margaret asked when she caught sight of this too. Victoria seemed to be suppressing the pain. Yes, she replied. I think I just need to lie down for the evening. Uh, do you need any help? Sophia offered. No, I'll be fine. Please, there's no need to worry about me, she said, excusing herself from the table. I just need to rest. I could see her gripping her stomach as she did. I wanted to leave the table as well, but my legs remained frozen, numb to the command from my brain. I just sat there watching her leave. For some reason, I couldn't shake the feeling of discomfort. After dinner, I made my way back to my room. In the hallway, I glanced down towards Victoria's door. What were we going to do now? The plan had failed. Tomorrow was the day I promised to be our last here. I entered my room, almost slamming the door shut. I could feel tears of anger growing in my eyes. Why did it have to go to hell? Why did these bastards have to ruin everything? Why? Why did I have to fuck it up so badly? I must have eventually passed out from my rage fit because I was soon awakened by the sound of voices and footsteps. The footsteps sounded urgent, rushing from one end of the hall to the next. Without warning, a blood-curdling wail filled the air. It grew so loud that I had to put my hands over my ears. It sounded like a woman's voice. Victoria's. I raced to my door, ready to rip it open, but immediately I stopped myself. I could hear a sound worse than her wail. It was so eerie and frightening that it sent an icy chill down my spine. What I heard was the loud chanting of voices. They spoke in unison, reciting words I couldn't comprehend. I could see a dim light flicker across the door's bottom crack. All it did, I could hear Victoria's moans of pain. The voices grew louder, passing by my door, eventually fading into the distance. I cracked open my door to look out, which let out its signature creak. I was sure it would alert them, and halting it, mid-swing, I could see the hallway was still quiet. I opened the door fully, taking a step outside. It was dark and absent of light. Under my shoe, I felt something wet. I took up my phone and used the backlight to get a better view. Some kind of liquid, maybe water. I was ready to believe this thought until I accidentally dropped my phone in it. I quickly grabbed it in a panic, wiping it off, but the liquid seemed only to smear. I took my phone back to my room to see it in better light. It wasn't water. It was blood. My heart skipped at the realization of this. I went back in the hallway using my phone's light again over the liquid. I could make out more of it leading to the stairs. The other end of the hallway showed the trail lead back to Victoria's room, which had its lights on. I swallowed hard and I walked toward it, trying to mentally prepare myself for the worst. I reached it and slowly edged my way in. There was blood there. A trail of it ran from the door up to her bed. The sheets were completely doused in red. I could smell her perfume mixed with smoke and the metallic smell of blood. I felt my stomach give in at the sight. Immediately, I vomited all that I'd eaten. 
I felt my knees weaken and give way as well, falling to the ground, dropping my phone in the process. I, I must have blacked out for a few seconds before regaining my awareness. When I regained consciousness, I noticed my phone's backlight about to turn to black. I quickly got up, horrified that I had been laying next to blood. What happened in here? I grabbed my phone, I glanced at the bed, a puddle of red soaked the lower half of the sheets. However, I noticed there was another spot, much smaller, forming near the pillow. I slowly reached for it, unsure of what I was about to see. I couldn't imagine anything worse, but I was wrong. To my dismay, I found a finger. A finger. It was clearly cut off with the tip of its bone sticking out of the reddish colored flesh. It appeared to be Victoria's. It, it had to have been. Next to the finger was a small knife with its tip covered in blood. Why, why did she cut it off? I observed the finger closer and realized the ring. Doused in red. She cut off her finger so that I would have it. The key to the congregation room. She must have done so out of desperation. I thought about the, the pain that she had shown from her contractions at dinner. She must have felt it. It was... It was time. Time for the child. Those sick bastards were going through with their ritual. They didn't care about Victoria. The old woman was right. I had to do something. I promised her that I would get her out of here. That I was going to keep it. I, 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 I hesitantly picked up her finger. It was still warm and I placed it in my pocket with care. Racing out of the room, I came to a stop when I remembered the gun kept by Terence. It was something I was probably going to need. His door was locked when I tried to open it, but I didn't care. I didn't have time to waste and began kicking it until the, until the handle caved in. I pushed it open, running to the desk drawer where I had last seen the gun. I opened it and smiled. It was still there. I grabbed it, feeling its weight fall into my hand. With my thumb, I popped its wheel open and revealed six bullets lined in its chamber. Perfect, I thought, and tucked it into the back of my pants. And then I ran out of the room. I got to the bottom of the stairs and noticed that the lobby was dark. The scent of candles in the air. A trail of blood from earlier could be seen leading from the congregation room. I rested my ear upon the double doors to listen. It was silent. No voices or wails from Victoria. Something wasn't right. I tried the handle only to find it locked as it always was. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the finger. I checked the small indent on the door and placed it up against it and twisted it to the right the way that I remembered Victoria doing so. And instantly, there was a soft click from the door. I pulled at the handle again and could feel the door move. This was it. I placed the finger back in my pocket and peeked through the small crack. All I could see was darkness. I opened the door wider and was met with a warm breeze to my face. With it open, I could see a dim light flickering from the sides. I poked my head in first before completely entering. The light was coming from the candles mounted on the columns near the wall. With it, I could make out the room even more than I had the first time. The entire area looked older in the light. The walls appeared worn out, decayed, almost blackened as if burned. The columns appeared ancient and natural broiled, with cracks and fungus throughout. A deep scent of ash and moisture filled the air. I could now see the, the seeded hues they were carved from stone, similar to the columns. A few were split in areas, almost falling apart. The place looked like it had been there for centuries. The building must have been built around it. In the corner of my eye, I caught sight of a dark figure off to the side. A candlelight flickered across it, producing a vague outline of it. I swallowed hard, peering towards the thing with frightened eyes. Something was there. Something was there, and it was watching me. Hello? I called out softly to it. I could feel every hair stand up on my neck. H Hello? I said again my voice quivering. The figure gave no answer in return. I slowly walked to it, watching as the light flickered across it with the distance closing between us. I could see its pale face in the light. My heart plummeted. Empty black holes were present where its eyes were supposed to be. The mouth of it was gaped open wide, almost like it was screaming in terror, but no noise had come out. I was ready to bolt out of there until I noticed that... that it did... nothing. It didn't even move. Cautiously, I approached the figure with my hands stretched out. I eased cautiously, half expecting it to lash out at me at any moment. Finally, I touched its surface. When I did, I took a deep sigh of relief. It was only a mask. I picked it up, revealing its disturbing features even more closely. I looked back at the wall to see the figure was in 
fact a black cloak of some kind. I pulled it off, releasing it from the hook, and brought both objects into the light. It was a cloak and a mask, all right, thank goodness. Was this what they wore during their ceremonies? I looked back at the wall to see several other empty hooks lined. Glancing back at the cloak, I noticed a fading image running across it. It's a symbol, but not like the one on the door. I recognized this one. It was an inverted cross. It had chains attached to it as well, hanging from its waistline. It must have been Victoria. Without warning, I was startled by the faint echo of a woman's wails. It was coming from further back in the room. I followed the noise which brought me to the altar. At the top, I could make out a familiar sight behind the podium. It was the statue from before, still horrid to the eyes as ever. As I climbed the stairs, the image of the statue became more apparent. It still brought an eerie feeling to me, right down to my bones. I couldn't stand the sight of it, and I looked away as I passed it. Behind it, I saw the mouth of a cave. Reaching it, I could see it stretch deep down into the darkness. It was dimly lit by a few candles mounted on the walls, stone steps descending with it. I could feel a warm breeze flowing from it like the breath of a large beast. Every so often, a wail would echo from its depths, sending my heart into its own depths with it. This was crazy. How could all of this be in here? It was clear that this, all of it, was way over my head. I wanted to turn around. God knows I wanted to. With each wail, I thought of Victoria. I couldn't leave her to suffer. I glanced down at my hands to discover that I was still holding the cloak and the mask. It was a long shot, but I thought if I wore it, it would help me blend in. Even if it bought me only a few minutes, I could use whatever edge I could get. I threw on the cloak. I placed the mask over my face. I took one last breath. and began making my descent. Hey there! The stairs felt like they would never end. I pressed onward, though, passing by one of the mounted candles every so often. In between them, I was left in utter darkness, the whim of my own footing. I took my time, walking down them, adding to the anxiety to reach the bottom. Voices began to echo from the abyss below, bouncing off the walls. Once again, I could hear their monotone words being spoken in unison, still incomprehensible to me. In the darkness, the words were even more nerve-wracking. It almost didn't sound human. The last of the stairs brought me to a large chasm. A few candles were mounted on these walls as well, but they weren't of much help. I could see their light reveal a set of different tunnels pointing in diverse directions. From here, it looked like I had to choose a path. But which one was right? If I chose wrong, I knew it would be nearly impossible to retrace my steps, especially in this darkness. The voices from earlier began to echo once again. Among the cave walls, they bounced all around, amplified by the acoustics. I focused on the sound, trying to pinpoint their origin. Finally, after several minutes, I was able to determine they were coming from the tunnel on the left. So I headed in that direction. The tunnel was completely dark, absent of candles. A few times I tripped on the rocky surface, but using the walls helped maintain my balance. I continued to stretch onward. All I could see was an endless void in front of me. As I walked, I felt the urge to stop, feeling as if I would smack into a wall or something. All the while, the voices continued their chanting, growing louder the more I pushed forward. Finally, I reached an opening. It was glowing, all the while producing a heat wave. I came to a rocky perch on the side. I could see another set of stone stairs curving down to the area below. I didn't need to take them, because it gave a good overview of everything below. I crouched and moved closer to get a better view. What I saw would forever be burned in my mind. Below, I could see four individuals standing in a square formation, each facing inward. Four bowls containing an intense fire was set in between each of the individuals forming together some sort of diamond. There were markings in red, 
producing an arrangement of symbols and designs behind each of the figures. I noticed how all of them donned the same cloak and mask as I was wearing. Each of them was slowly bobbing their heads, their hands clasped as if in prayer, except for one. The one was holding up a camcorder to film it all. Standing in the center, I saw a fifth person. This one wore a different cloak. It was pale white, more loosely fit than the others. The mask worn was black instead of white, almost as dark as, as dark as the tunnel itself. If not for the light from the bowls, it would have looked like a faceless being. It had to be the Reverend. Each time he spoke out that strange language, the others would repeat it in unison. My eyes widened when I saw what was behind the Reverend. There was a stone table covered with a white sheet, and on it, I saw Victoria, clenching her stomach in pain. Every so often, she would let out an intense wail that filled the air. The white sheet underneath her was half soaked in blood. No one. I didn't know what to do now that I was here. Without warning, I was pulled from my thoughts when I felt something touch my shoulder. I spun around, almost screaming out loud. However, my eyes recognized the figure crouching behind me. It was the old woman. Victoria's mother. She... She had followed me down here. She held up a finger to her lips, slowly crept past me to look below. We must stop this before it's too late. She whispered over my shoulder. How? I asked. What can we do? We can't just rush down there without some sort of plan. She nodded in agreement. I know. We need to sprinkle this within their inner circle, she said, pulling out a small glass vial. It was filled with a clear liquid. At the stage she's on now, Victoria will need some of this on her as well. That's it? I asked sourly. That's the plan? Yes, she replied, returning her gaze below. Once this is sprinkled, I will need to recite my own incantation to cancel out the effects of this ritual. Only then will Victoria be saved and the rest of the world. I shivered a little. The world? He never did mention what would happen if that child was born. Nothing good, I assure you. But that will not happen. Listen, I have a plan. I was all ears. And leaned close. We need to draw them away from here so that I can conduct the incantation. How are we going to do that? A distraction, of course, she replied, producing a twisted smile. You need their undivided attention. I need to conduct the ceremony, so for that, we have to lead them away. <sighs> I sighed deeply. I really didn't like this plan already, but it seemed like the only other option. After taking a few breaths, I stood up to announce my presence. Hey! I yelled out. It was all I could think to say. Immediately, they all went silent, staring up at me. The light bounced off their faces of their twisted masks. Not one said a word until the reverend spoke out. Ah, Marcus, is that you? He asked out loud. What a surprise it is to see you down here. The hell is going on here? I stammered. What are you fucks doing with Victoria? Bastards better let her go or... Or, uh, uh, I'll get the police involved. The reverend chuckled. His mask bounced a little. Marcus, he said softly, almost in a joking manner. When you first arrived, I, I'll admit I thought I understood everything about you, but just from our conversation and the time... You look like nothing more but a stammering piglet that's gone astray. <laughs> you couldn't even get your words right. I could see the others slowly moving away from their spots, edging their way to the seats. But you surprised me! With your bold antics, you sneaked into our congregation room, attempted to steal one of my members' rings. Yeah, I know about that, he continued. My eyes lit up. How could he have known? <laughs> he even warmed up to Victoria, convincing her to leave all this and her family behind. Now that, my boy, is something. Tell me, 
I know you're sick of seeing everyone suffer like your grandmother or even your mother that passed away when you were young. I was dumbstruck. How did he know all of this? He couldn't have. He continued. All those people out there in the world as well suffering, doing so unnecessarily. And for what reason? But for what he wants, he said, pointing upward. With Lanius, though, we can reshape this world. He'll reshape everything in his image, erase all that pain, all that suffering. Everything will be set right the way it should be. Why not be willing to join him in this transformation? I can see the other members drawing closer up to the stairs. Think about it, Marcus. Are we really that bad of people? Look at yourself. What have you really believed in that you could not hold on to? Join us down here. Be a part of that new world, a new direction. You're already halfway there. You got what you need on you right now. So why not come down the path fully? He said, lifting up his hands. Victoria's suffering right now. But when this is all over, she won't anymore. You can even be with her in the new world. Is that what you want? Isn't it? My eyes glanced over at Victoria. Still gasping in pain, her eyes clenched painfully shut. I listened as she let out another horrific wail like it. I could see an impression of something moving around in her, pressing upward against her skin. My voice was lost. I was unable to say anything. This bastard was crazy. They all were. However, if, if that truly was the case, why was I so hesitant? Was there a part of me that was, who was wanting this, that believed in this? Immediately, the old woman stood up to reveal herself. Poisonous words never fail to excrete from your mouth, you sniffling snake, she hissed. Who's up there with you, Marcus? Who do you think, you foul bastard? Carolina, he said, surprised. I must admit, I... I am a bit shocked to see you still living. <laughs> I must ask how you managed to escape the gaze of Linnaeus. Wouldn't you like to know? You're not the only one who can conjure up a spell or two. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, I always were an unpredictable one, Carolina. I, I truly was heartbroken when I learned you weren't fully on board with us. She scoffed at this. So, Marcus... What will it be? He asked, returning his attention to me. I glanced over to see the old woman's eyes gleaming at me from the shadows. She shook her head in dismay, mouthing something softly. I couldn't hear her words, but I could make out the last word escaping her lips. Lies. No. I said softly. Come again! I said no, you satanic fox! He sighed, dropping his arms. Oh, that's too bad, son. He gestured with his head to the others, who immediately sprang up to the stairs. Move it, the old woman yelled, bolting down the tunnel we both entered from. I was surprised that she was even able to move at such a speed without wasting time. I quickly hurried behind her. I could hear their footsteps echoing, following us. I didn't know where I was going. There's nothing but endless void before me. I felt my feet trip again a few times as I went. My lungs were burning, begging me to stop, but the adrenaline pumping through me must have kept me going. Eventually, we reached the other chasm with all the tunnels. We need to split them up. Try to lose them in the best manner you can, she said in deep breaths. I was half out of breath myself, barely catching what she was saying. Without hesitation, she ran off into the tunnels on the left. I took the hint and darted down the nearest one to my right. On the inside? Um, on the inside? I hoped that I hadn't chosen the one with the dead end. The tunnel itself was very tight. I felt the sharp edges of the walls scrape against my forearms a few times before I pressed forward. Thinking quickly, I pulled out my phone, using its light to help guide the way. Ahead of me, my eyes made out what I had dreaded would happen. I had reached a dead end. Shit! I yelled out. There was no way I could turn around, not if they were following me. However, I was surprised to find the walls wasn't like the tunnel's uneven texture. Looking closer, it appeared to be a type of door. 
It was still made of stone, but it was smooth. It had markings engraved along it. I couldn't make it out, but the light of my phone revealed a familiar sight. I could see a small indent with a symbol etched into it. It was similar to the one on the congregation room's doors. The finger, I thought out loud. I reached into my pocket, trying to find it. Behind me, I could hear the clapping of footsteps gaining on me. I struggled to pull out the damn thing, and when I did, I pressed it up against the indent and twisted. At first, nothing happened. But soon, the door began to move. A loud moan produced from it as it lifted slowly upward. I could hear the footsteps getting closer, but the door was still at my ankles. I yelled and cursed at the damn thing to hurry until at last it was up to my chest. It was good enough for me. I was ready to bolt through the opening when suddenly... I was tackled from behind. The force from the tackle sent me forward along with my attacker. We both rolled into the room, sliding away from each other. I landed crudely, banging my knee and elbow in the process. It wasn't until I looked up that I caught the scent of something putrid in the air. The room we entered was colder than the other areas and seemed to be darker. My impaired vision must have amplified my senses of smell because I was completely appalled by it. It was as if something had been decaying, or rather, many things had. Under my hand, I felt something hard poke me. I couldn't see the object clearly, but I felt how smooth it was, almost too perfect. Around it, I felt other objects with the same feeling. I wanted to use my cell phone, but I couldn't find it, clearly dropped from the fall. I did, however, hear a man grunting, apparently my attacker. You little shit, I knew you would have been in trouble from the start, I heard him say. The voice sounded like Terrence. I could hear him standing up. His breathing was still rapid from the chase. My heart leapt into my throat. I tried to be extra careful while I rose to my feet, hoping not to draw his attention. If he was like me, then it was impossible to see anything in the darkness. If quiet enough, he could probably sneak past him. I started moving forward, taking small steps while I listened for him. The Reverend told me about the ring. You thought you were slick about it, huh? He yelled out, his voice echoing. You see, the Reverend knows all and sees all. I could hear his footsteps pacing around. The acoustics of the room made it hard to pinpoint his exact position. Then you stole one of our tomes! But I found it, he continued. I was glad you did, though. You got to see what's coming to that bitch. I hope you enjoyed every last of it, it said. I don't know what came over me after that. After hearing those disgusting words, I somehow managed to find and pounce on Terrence in an immense rage. I didn't hesitate, and I swung where I thought his head was, striking a hard surface. I yelled out in pain. It was his mask that I struck. He laughed, rendering a strong blow into my stomach. I felt the wind painfully rip its way from my mouth. Afterward, he pushed me away, which sent me falling on my back. I felt the sting of something hard press itself against me. I reached behind for the object and my eyes lit up. Immediately after his hands grabbed at my legs to pull me closer, still in pain, I kicked at him and pulled out the object from below. I cocked it, aimed in his direction, and pulled the trigger. A flash of light lit up the entire area for a split second, followed by a loud BANG! The noise echoed throughout the chasm and beyond. The flash of light was enough for me to locate my phone. I grabbed at it, pushed a button, and aimed it in front of me. I could see Terrence in the illumination gripping his arm in pain. The blood from his wound dripped onto the ground. <sighs> you little... He croaked. He started, but croaked in pain. The gun shook in my hand. This is the first time I'd ever shot one before, let alone at a person. I didn't get time to decide what to do next. There was a deep growl that filled the air and echoed all around us. The ground almost felt like it was trembling. Further back in the room, I could hear something twisting around. Its movements were cracky and heavy. The odor from earlier grew stronger, flooding my nose even more than before. Shit. It's awake! I heard Terrence scream out. He turned to leave, yet before I could even blink, I felt a large rush of wind race past me. The smell of its odor lingered behind me. Whatever it was, it was fast. It was huge. The next thing I heard was it pouncing on Terrence. I could hear it ripping into him, tearing pieces apart. His screams flooded the air, a blood-curdling shrill so intense it drew tears from my eyes. I could hear the thing continue to tear at him, cracking bone as it did. Somehow I managed to find the feeling in my legs and bolted out of the room. Behind me, I heard the thing let out a frightening roar. I didn't stop running, though. Pushing as hard as I could through the tight walls, I could hear its heavy footsteps pounding behind me, the snarls from its breathing growing closer to my ears. It was gaining quickly, and without thinking, I aimed the gun behind me and fired off a few rounds. It wasn't until after the third round that I heard another loud roar. The footsteps behind me immediately came to a halt. I continued running, until I reached the open area once again. I was out of breath, but I knew I couldn't stop. 
That thing was sure to continue its pursuit soon, so I, I couldn't waste any time. Before I could fully gain my composure, I heard footsteps heading in my direction. They weren't from the tunnel behind me, but ahead. I quickly readied my gun, ready to fire again. Three figures emerged from the darkness, racing frantically. It was the other church members. I had already fired four bullets, which meant that I only had two left. There were three of them, so I would have to decide carefully who I wanted to shoot. It came to a halt in front of me. Hello, Marcus, I heard Margaret's voice speak from out of the three. Have you finally stopped running? Back the fuck off, I yelled. The gun still pointed at them. If I have to, I will kill you crazy bastards. I heard one of them giggle. It must have been Sophia. Then slowly began edging their way towards me. I backed up a little, keeping the gun trained on them. I started to shift to the side, hoping to align the next tunnel to my back. It was clear this gun was doing nothing for me. I probably would only have enough time to shoot one before the others rushed in. I would need to be quick, so I could make a run for it. Come now, Marcus. Have you realized it yet? You really think we invited you all the way out here just to install some silly computers? Margaret began. I was stunned when I heard this. What the hell are you talking about? Why else would I be here? She chuckled. We needed a legitimate reason to get you out here, and here you are. You don't even know who I am, I said. She was clearly talking nonsense. <laughs> Is that what you think? I'm surprised none of this appears familiar to you. You have, you have, after all, been down this path before. My hand slowly lowered the gun. I don't know why, but a small portion of me believed even if it did sound ludicrous. What do you mean? It's Linnaeus. He's always had a fascination in you. Something about you, he... She started to say, but trailed in her words. What about me? Before she could answer, a large figure bolted from the shadows, pounced on Margaret. It was that horrid creature from earlier. It had caught up. Now, among the dim candlelight, I could make out more of its features. I really wished those candles weren't there. Through the poor lighting, I could see its thin, elongated arms, the sharp talons for fingers, massive horns extended from its back, its loose, wild hair fell across its crude snout of a face, its blood-colored eyes glowed, piercing the darkness. I watched as it began tearing into Margaret, as it had with Terence. With each new sound of splitting flesh came a louder shrill from her. Her loud cries bounced off the walls, extending throughout the tunnel. The others attempted to flee, but they didn't get far. The creature was merciless, pouncing on them and tearing into them in the same manner. Suddenly, I felt a harsh tug in my arm pulling me down the tunnel behind. It was the old woman. I didn't know where she'd come from, but I didn't question her. The tormenting screams of the others continued to resonate in the air. The burning pain in my lungs returned as we tried to run. The old woman yelled back not to stop. I could hear the struggle in her voice as well to maintain the pace. There seemed to be no end to the tunnel. It felt like we were running in place, making no progress. In the midst of my exhaustion, I felt my foot drag, causing me to lose my balance. I fell hard, slamming onto my already injured knee. Get up! Get up now! The old woman screamed at me. I tried, but struggled to do so, caught in the blend of pain and exhaustion. I tried to pull myself up using the wall. Behind me, I could hear the rapid thumping of large footsteps once again. I could feel the old woman help me up. She threw my arm over her shoulder and began assisting me forward. However, it was too late. We could feel the gaze emanating from the creature behind us. Our eyes must have fully adjusted to the dark because I could clearly make out its massive form. Its hot breath blew against our faces, the smell of fresh blood lingering in it. The old woman pushed me away. Run! Now! She said softly. What? I replied back in shock. No! We have to stick together! No, you must go. I will hold it off. But go! Her voice startled me. I quickly turned and I began hobbling away. Behind me I could still hear her. Foul demon! Think you've won! The creature rendered. A harsh snarl in return, I could hear her begin to recite strange words in another language, and the creature sounded affected, screaming loud roars of pain. Whatever she was saying, it was clearly working. I paused to look back, just making out their faint outlines in the dark. I wondered if what she was doing was actually going to stop it. However, I saw the creature swinging one of its long arms at her. Her body flew against the wall, producing a sickening crack. 
Her words instantly died. Not long after, I could hear the thing ripping away at her. The blow must have been enough to kill her because she didn't yell in pain. I went from hopping aggressively on one foot to a full-fledged run. I, I ignored the pain from my knee, feeling fear and adrenaline engulfing me. Up ahead, I could see a light from the end. I knew I didn't have much time until the thing would continue its pursuit for me. I reached the opening, revealing the original ritual area that I'd come across. I was hesitant in approaching the perch, but I did so looking down. Victoria was still down there. Based on her increased wails, it wouldn't be long before she gave birth. I saw no trace of the Reverend. I made my way down the stairs, approaching the symbols surrounding Victoria. Up close, I could tell they were made from blood. The bowls were still blazing. The heat from them was intense, forcing sweat down my face. When I approached Victoria, her eyes fell upon me. I could see the fear returning in them. Stay. Stay the fuck away from me, she yelled, struggling with words. I was taken back by this, but then I remembered I was still wearing the mask. I quickly removed it and was revealed to see her eyes light up upon seeing me. Marcus. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here, Victoria, I answered, rushing to her side. Tears formed in her eyes. Marcus, please. She stopped mid-sentence, rendering another wail. She continued screaming. I could hear her vocals become rasped from the strain. I didn't know what to do. A massive lump moved across her stomach, uncontrollably pressing up against her skin. I didn't think it was possible, but her screams grew even louder. I felt completely useless right now. Just when I thought that it couldn't get any worse, I heard a familiar roar from above. The creature from earlier had returned. I could see its burning red eyes beaming down from the perch. It leapt from the top, landing with a loud thud. Its disturbing form hunched over, breathing a rapid rhythm, exhaling a snarl in between. Now fully in the light, I felt my stomach tighten at its presence. The thought of the statue came to my mind. This thing was almost a spitting image of it, but only worse. Its face was more disturbing in person, with its blackened, humanoid dog features. The nose atop its snout appeared caved in, flaring with its breathing. Its eyes were beady, completely dyed with a crimson red atop its forehead. It held a large, closed eye. I stood in between Victoria and the beast. I wasn't going to let this thing do anything to her. I raised the gun up, ready to fire, waiting for it to make a move. Yet that was it. It did nothing. It just stood there. Breathing. Come on! I yelled trying to provoke it. Do it! Come at me, you sick fuck! It did nothing still. Instead, the edge of its lips curled up in a twisted smile. I felt a shiver run down my spine. The damn thing was smiling at me. It was. I was ready to fire the gun, but then I noticed the bullet holes in it. From where it had been previously hit, two of the bullets had managed to hit it, but they stuck out of its wounds, barely penetrating it. It was useless. The gun did nothing. Realizing this, I lowered it, eventually letting it drop to the ground. When I did, the smile grew wider. What the hell are you? That, my boy, I heard the reverend's voice answer out loud, is Linnaeus, the white eye of time. I could hear it behind me, but I didn't dare break my eyes away from the creature. He'll become the world's new master. I was speechless. Your witness, his rebirth into this world, Marcus. He'll reshape it into his image. Now, witness. As if on cue, the creature began to roar into the air. I could see the rows of its blood-covered teeth extend deep back into its throat. It felt as if the whole room was rumbling, and suddenly... It collapsed onto the ground, lying motionless. I was confused. 
Did it die? If it did, what killed it? Victoria broke the silence, screaming at a level a human shouldn't be able to reach. The form within her moved around vigorously, eventually tearing its way free. Blood flew in all directions, some spattering across me. My eyes turned to see a blood-soaked creature wallowing around in the remains of Victoria. It looked to be the size of a dog. I could see the sharp talons from one of its lanky arms clinging to the side of the table. Curled horns protrude from its head, entangled with the wild strands of its hair. It sniffed the air for a while before turning its attention to me. I felt tears forming in my eyes. Immediately, my, I felt my stomach give in, a hurtling to the side. It, it, it hurt because I had already done so earlier and there was nothing left to give. Leaning over the mess I produced, I could only think of one thing. Victoria. In the end, I could do nothing. Nothing but watch her suffer. She trusted me to save her. And I failed her. The creature looked like a miniature version of its previous self, however, its third eye was open this time. It was completely white, void of pupil, blinking asynchronously to its smaller ones. Despite having no pupil, I could feel its white-eyed gaze upon me. My head began buzzing, starting as a simple vibration. The vibration escalated into an immense outpour of pain. I could see images in my head. They were images of places in the world of people. These people were screaming for their lives. The sky above them was black. The streets littered with thousands of bodies lying lifeless and torn to pieces. Fires were brewing over. Damaged cars with half-burnt corpses sitting in their seats. Faces of horrendous beings too atrocious to describe were seen everywhere, tearing apart at those, those unable to escape. The images of the images flooded my head. I was at the mercy of them as the pain increased. The more they appeared, tears fell endlessly from my eyes. Why was I being shown these horrible things? Just when I thought I couldn't take any more, they stopped. I slumped over, still feeling my head throb. I could, I could still see their faces, hear their screams. Did you see it, Marcus? Did you see the dream he produced in your mind? The Reverend asked. He walked from the shadows into the light. He slowly removed the mask from his face. What? What the hell was that? I asked. I could still feel lingering amounts of pain. It took me years to produce the revitalization. First, he had to get, get stronger to do so. He needed a vessel, too. I, too, was frightened when I, I first laid eyes upon him, but he showed me his intentions. From then, I was, I was enlightened. He speaks to me with his white eye. That's how I knew everything was, everything about you back there. I'm sure he gave you a glimpse of the paradise to be. Paradise, I repeated, still in the daze. Is that, is that what the fuck you're calling that? Yes. Aeneas will shape this world into his image. Imagine such sweet blue skies, endless green pastures with trees, Flowing abundantly with, with, with scrumptious fruit. No more pain, no more suffering. A true, renewed Eden. I, I know it's hard to conceive all of this. How, how could we in the current world that we live in? His power is beyond our understanding. But he can, he can open the ripples of time. He can alter what he likes. Insert what he likes. He can return to the past vessel he chooses. Every time he possesses the younger self, growing, growing with them until they become, till they become of age, doing it repeatedly makes him stronger. When he finally reaches fruition, he needs to be born of human flesh. Victoria. Correct. Now is the time, Marcus. Once he does it again, it'll be his last. He'll be permanently infused with his new vessel. You? I asked, still feeling the throb in my head. Oh, come on now, Marcus. I, I've merely been a humble servant, ensuring everything was arranged properly for his rebirth. Linnaeus has always been interested in you. You recall the pages of the tome, yes? Who do you think that was with Linnaeus? I shook my head in disbelief. It, it didn't make sense. There was no way it could have been me. 
You're lying. That's impossible. It... Why me? Well, you see, Marcus, Linnea sees all aspects of time, all possibilities out of everyone. He saw you to be the best candidate to lead to the outcome he desired. You should be honored. I don't understand. He said he's always been using me, but I don't... I don't recall any of those times at all. Of course you don't, Marcus. Each time Linnaeus removed your memory after transferring to, to your younger body. Believe it or not, we've always... We've already had this conversation before. <laughs> I only recall because he allows me to. You see, I'm, I'm the one ensuring everything goes as planned accordingly. You go back as you've done before. This time it'll be for good. Sorry to say, though. What is left of Marcus Pale? Will be no more. I found myself shaking my head again. I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. Please, Marcus! Each time we go through this little charade, I try to I try to get you a chance to let you willingly come forward, but as always, you fight it. How about switching it up for a change? Give in. It's inevitable regardless. What will it be, Marcus? I remained in silence. Trying to absorb everything. I was it was too much. How could it all possibly be true. There was no way of telling otherwise. It seemed like a lose-lose situation. I think I started to answer. I think you're full of shit. I said, rendering a small smirk. His eyes seemed to twitch with dissatisfaction. Very disappointing, he said, staring his back. I could see his hand move into his cloak. He turned around, producing a gun in his hand, and he fired the weapon, missing me. I quickly drew myself to the ground, grabbing my own gun. I pointed it and shot around just as he did. His shot grazed my side, only piercing my cloak. My shot, however, hit him in the leg. He fell to the ground. Immediately, he proceeded to lift his gun, struggling to aim at me. I walked over to him, keeping my own pointed at him. Standing over him, I held it to his face. He smiled at me, dropping his own in defeat. <laughs> you, you, you think this hadn't already happened, Marcus? It's inevitable, he said. The smile grew wider on his face. I didn't answer and simply pulled the trigger. His body immediately went limp. I remained over him with the gun still pointed at it. I never thought killing someone would be so satisfying. I didn't like this thought, though. There was something about this place, whatever it was. I was ready to leave it. Unexpectedly, I felt the same painful pulse from earlier flood my head. I fell to my knees, gripping my head, and when I turned, I could see the creature crawling from the table, dragging its deformed limp legs. It snarled at me, moving close in speed. I held the gun in my hand and pulled the trigger. But it only clicked. I repeated the action only to receive the same result. It was empty. Quickly, I reached over with my other hand and grabbed the Reverend's gun. Yet it was too late. The thing pounced on me, its slimy hands gripping my neck. I could feel its hot, putrid breath on my face and see pieces of flesh clinging to its jagged teeth. I wanted to throw the damn thing off, but I could feel the pain in my head amplify. It was hard to describe, but I, I could feel its presence in my mind. It was like it was, it, it was searching for something. It wasn't until the last minute that I could visibly see what I had found. Immediately, we were both engulfed in a blinding light from out of nowhere. When the light cleared, I found myself lying in something cold. When I stood to my feet, I realized it was snow. There was snow everywhere. Where, where was I? 
I looked around, seeing cars covered in snow as well. Several buildings loomed around me, all with something in common. Decorations. They were all reeves and uh, lights, either on their doors or around the buildings. Christmas. How could that be? It was, it was July. Something about this area was familiar, but I didn't know why. The buildings before me were, were fairly tall, maybe four stories. Something about it drew me towards it. Through the glass, I could see my reflection. I could see that, that horrifying mask over my face. How did it, how did it get back on my face? I noticed both the guns still in my hands. I can't describe it, but I, I, I felt lighthearted. I could hardly recall what I'd been doing prior to arriving here. In fact, I didn't even remember where I had got this cloak from. I felt the urge to enter the building. I tucked the guns away. I entered, and inside I noticed several closed doors, along with a staircase to the side. This must have been an, an apartment building. I couldn't pull myself away from this feeling. Letting it take me to the stairs, I began climbing, passing more doors on either floor, each with their own set of wreaths or anything Christmas-related. With each floor, I tried searching for some hint of why I was here. I continued upward until reaching the third floor. I was led to a door on the left marked 3A. Why was I brought here? I felt my hands lift as if it had a mind of its own. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't gain control over it. I banged on the door. Inside, I could hear someone moving towards the entrance. Next, I felt my hand reach back into my cloak, pulling out the revolver. Fear filled my eyes. Why was I grabbing the gun? I wanted to warn the person inside not to open the door, but my mouth wouldn't obey either. To my horror, I listened as the bolt unlocked and the door opened. My eyes could not comprehend the sight before me. The person in front of me was my father. He looked very young, more than I, than last time when I saw him, but it was him. How was it possible? Without warning, my hand struck him across the face. Next, my legs kicked him back. The woman inside gave off an ear-splitting scream in shock. It was the young face of my real mother. She was alive. But how? The apartment was heavily decorated to suit the Christmas atmosphere. It had a tree nicely decorated with, with presents piled underneath. I couldn't help but feel a sense of familiarity to what was transpiring before me. Again, my hand moved without command, shutting the door and locking the bolt. He pointed the gun at my parents. Fear filled my eyes. Why are you doing this? My father asked, gripping his head. What do you want? I wanted to answer. I wanted to answer, but I couldn't. To my side, I heard a soft noise. I looked over and saw a young child playing with a book. It was me. I was actually in the presence of my younger self. I felt a strong force vibrating through my head, feeling it filter out. It was odd, but it looked almost like the fumes of gasoline flowing towards my younger self. It, it suddenly hit me. I felt a partial memory return. I, I recalled the words of the Reverend. This was happening to me because of that thing, Linnaeus. It was inside me, controlling my actions. It needed to take over my younger self for its vessel. I could feel its presence vacating my body, watching it flood into my younger self, my my parents probably couldn't see it, only me. I, I, I couldn't let this happen. I wasn't about to become one with this thing for the rest of my life. Concentrating, I attempted to move my hand. The one with the gun was solid and unmovable. The finger in that hand began moving on its own accord. I could feel it tightening on the trigger. The gun was still aimed at my mother. Why was it doing this? Why was it trying to kill my mother in the process? I made every attempt to stop my hand, but it wouldn't listen. I was already... Are all ready to give in until my my mind had another lapse in memory. I recalled I recalled having a dream. It was similar to what was happening right now, but but slightly different. I tried to focus, attempting to recall more of the dream. For some reason, it was so hard to do so. I didn't know why, but it felt it felt necessary to remember it. More pieces began to come together. In the dream, I saw myself fire the gun. It wasn't at my mother. No, I shot myself, the younger me. It was puzzling that I already did this. 
Another piece of the dream came to me. There was a bright light, and in the in the light was a face. I could recall the face this time. It was the smiling face of my mother. She was completely encased in light, as if as if the source of it. And at that moment, I understood everything. I knew what I needed to do. I attempted to, to concentrate on my other hand, focusing on the image of it, moving to my command, hoping the thought would render it. I, I, I could gradually feel my control returning. Somehow, the more the creature left me, the more I gained feeling in my body. I concentrated on moving my arm, feeling its mobility. With it, I reached down into my cloak and felt around until I recognized the object. I pulled out the second gun, aiming it at my younger self. My mother before me let out a loud shriek when she saw this. I could feel parts of my arm wanting to drop the gun, but I fought against it, aiming at the child. The creature must have picked up on my pain because it started the flood images through my head again. This time, there were people that I had known or, or would come to know, my friends, my loved ones, everyone. It was it was like it was trying to get me to understand the consequences if, the, if I continued my actions. I, I could see the fumes attempting to pump faster into my younger body, and finally I saw the last of them completely enter my younger self. My one-year-old self stared at me innocently. This moment, this moment made sense now. I could picture the dream that brought me into all of this. This foul creature had controlled me for the last time. All this time, it had been me who had been the execution of my own mother. I was the monster, the crazy loon that had broken in all those years ago. No, he made me the crazy loon. He he altered time. I was the closest person to help him realize his plan. However, the creature probably saw it. He saw in all the infinite possibilities of time that my mother was the only threat to this plan. I laughed to myself. It was ironic that even in death, even in death, she found a way to warn me fighting me with an escape route. Linnaeus' own tearing through time and space, and it had backfired. In its own attempt to fulfill its ambition, it ended up creating its own demise. It couldn't stop the human spirit. It was powerless to love. My mother's interference was like, was like what the reverence had said verbatim. Inevitable. I smiled to myself. Squeezing back on the trigger, the bullet piercing through the child's skull, instantly dropping him. Now dead, I could feel the control of my body. It was as if a heavy aura of weight lifted from me. Sighing deeply, I dropped the gun to the ground. Slowly, I removed the mask from my face. Looking over at my parents, they were silent with eyes still fixated on their dead child. Finally, my mother returned her gaze to me. I was smiling at her. I was watching her eyes grow wide at seeing my face with tears forming in my eyes. I could feel a, a hint of pain growing across my forehead. Something warm began to run down my nose. My eyes looked deep into my mother's as I spoke. <laughs> Several words. I'm sorry. I had to, I... I did you a favor. Forgive me. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to take a quick second to say thank you for listening to tonight's video, and quite potentially tomorrow night's or last night's video, depending on how many times I've reused this recording. I especially want to give a big thanks to Eric Mary, John, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Frederick LaRue, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Saeed Alyasin, Tyler Ramberg, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Melissa Siegwert, Szymbinski, Daniel Rao, The Ginger Bros, Andrea Solvik, and Andrew Steinberg. You guys and everybody who is supporting on Patreon are the real MVPs. 
And if anyone would like to join them, you can always check me out at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Or if you'd just like to support the show without, you know, Patreon, then honestly, every view or minute or however you watch or listen to this creepypasta story time on the YouTube live stream or here on YouTube, the podcast on Amazon, Google Play, and on Spotify. And if you'd like to support my wife, then there's nothing better than listening to scary stories with some Dungeons & Dragons themed herbal teas. Etsy.com slash Ivory Monocle Tea. Alright kids, thanks so much for listening, and sweet dreams.